fight and we don't have to kill everybody in the whole wide world really just needs to chill no we don't have to fuss no 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 we don't have to fight hello everyone welcome back to another episode of just chill with oliver george this is episode number 80 and my guest is a independent filmmaker, a talented chef, amongst other things, a great dancer, so many things. We'll get to that in a minute, though. Um, before we do, I want to remind you, if you're watching on YouTube right now and you would prefer an audio-only version of this, you can get it on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, iHeartRadio, and other places like that. If you are listening to me on one of those platforms, though, and you didn't realize there was a visual side to the show, please come check it out here on YouTube. If you do come over to this side of things, I would really appreciate it if you would hit the subscribe button. You don't have to, but it does help me to keep connecting with new viewers and new listeners. So uh, if you've done that up to this point, or if you're just joining in now, thank you so much for your support. Finally, if you want to reach out to me, maybe you've got a cool guest idea or some general feedback about the show, you can hit me up on social media or send me an email at justchillpodcasting at gmail.com. And while you're sending me a message, let me know if you have any interest in uh, one of these hollow foil stickers with the show's logo, and I will mail you one free of charge. Back to the guest, as I mentioned, independent filmmaker. You have experience in front of the camera, behind the camera. Uh, you're also someone I've known since grade eight, and I'm super happy you're here. Ladies and gentlemen, it's Matt Joyce. Thank you so much for having me, man. This Thank is you for crazy. coming, dude. And, and honestly, like, I'm, I'm, I'm like super proud of you. Like, this is so cool that you Thank have you. this show. I feel like, like I watched that intro a bit, but all no, right. No, 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 not at all. <laughs> I mean, I just like, I... I'm not a big podcast person. Like I have the app on my phone and, and, and I listen to them a little bit and I know there's like Joe Rogan does a video one and everything, mm. but just the fact that you've nothing. And, and this is a topic I'd love to talk about. Nothing kind of like for me makes the human spirit more fulfilled than doing something that, like grows over time yeah, something definitely. that you're like super passionate about like like starting a youtube channel in general or, yeah. or anything you started Any artistic, it and really yeah but like there's something about the the kind of like wave of new technology and all the different platforms where you can like start a little outlet that will slowly build yeah. episode by episode over time. The and only problem being that everyone and their grandmother is doing it right now. But 100%. But if 100%. you're enjoying it for the process like I am, I really don't, you know, I, yeah. mean, I love subscribers. Thank you. But I do this because these are fun. Like the fact that I'm chilling with Matt Choice to me is super cool. It's, you know. Yeah. And I'm, I'm like taking the onus off of me and like putting it <laughs> on the show because I know how much traction the show has garnered over the last three years so like and and all the amazing people that you've had on the show so just like Thank and you. and the fact that we haven't reconnected in years so it's unreal it's, yeah it's like um i mean you and i we should say this right off the bat we recently were at a um a gathering for lack of a better term for a, a mutual friend who passed away a high school friend i would argue you're probably a little closer with him than me but i mean we both held him in the highest regard um, Graham Lockett, I will say, because yeah. he, his name deserves to be said. He's one of the warmest human beings I've ever met. Musically gifted, so friendly. So it, it was really a tragic, fucking horrible situation. But, um, you know, it was still also great to to see. Those, are, those situations are weird where you're at like a funeral type thing. Mm -hmm. But then you're equally kind of happy to be seeing all these faces you haven't seen in 20 years it's under horrible circumstances but mm -hmm. i was really really happy to be able to connect with you and, and andrew moncrief and, and other people that i haven't seen in way too long yeah um and of course when someone passes as well it, it really i don't know if it, it's the same for you but it really made me reflect a shit ton about cherishing these kind of moments and, and just mm -hmm. you know um being present and and catching up with people you haven't talked to in a while because you never know when the universe is going to just take them away one day and, and it's going to happen to all of us eventually, but it's fucking brutal when it's someone so young with so, so much promise. And I know, I know. And, and, and it's, yeah, exactly. Not to start things off on a bummer vibe here. No, but like, no, 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 no. This like is that, how we reconnected. hundred percent. Like that's how we reconnected. And that's the moment in which you were like, jump on the show, even if, well, because we talked, like, you know, I felt like I could have talked to you for hours at that yeah, gathering. And yeah. I was like, this is not enough. We need to. Yeah. Yeah. But I think, I think, like, you told me all the people that had been on the show and I, getting back to, like, imposter syndrome, I totally am kind of like, oh, like, I work in film in Toronto, but, like, 
I'm not promoting anything. I'm not like, there was like, it was like, there's no moment in time that I see in the foreseeable future where I'm like, you know, want to kind of like almost feel like I've arrived or I'm ready. I'm at that like notoriety moment. I'm pretty sure that I'm moment like, never comes. Exa- well, exactly. Well, we exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. And that's, that's kind of like when you, when you were like, don't even worry about it. Just come on the show. Yeah. We're just going to like shoot the shit, talk about life. Hang out, catch up. Exa- exactly. Yeah. And that's that. Like, well, and I hope I didn't come off as a braggart, like name dropping no, or anything, but no, at, no, you no, know, no. I felt like that was one of those instances where I was like, okay, I should, say some stuff about the show because I haven't seen you in like fucking yeah. 10 years and that's or why I was is, so know. proud of you well thank Absolutely. you and yeah. I, I really do appreciate that, that yeah. compliment man yeah. Um, but yeah Graham Graham you touched on one thing in in um, with Graham's thing like at, at, when, when we were at that at, thing when we were, yeah. when we were at the thing we were at the, the the family memorial I realized like because we're Cause like I, like I said, I really want to talk about mental health. I really want For to sure. talk about temperament, okay. um, and sensibility. And like, um, when we were at Graham's thing, I realized it was a perfect example of how someone with ADHD and anxiety, this guy, <laughs> um, I, I don't do well in groups. Oh no. I don't, I don't like I throughout all of my life, people have always said like, "Oh man, you're the life of the party. Like you're fucking, you're great." Yeah. Like, and I'm kind of like, eh, like there's there's a side of me that can come out. Um, yeah, I wouldn't call you shy. And, yeah, well, exactly. Yeah. And and if I'm drinking or whatever, like all of us, you know. But but um, that was great, great <laughs> that timing. Was, I was gonna, <laughs> I was gonna say. <laughs> <laughs> the cracking of that uh, sparkling. It's not even alcoholic. Yeah, but exa- exactly. Yeah. The cracking of that of that buble. Oh my god. Um, but like I I like your ahas actually. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> anyway, sorry to sorry to cut you off. Amazing. Um, I like cannot do groups four or five six. Doesn't even matter if I'm invited to like a small social like thing. A gathering or yeah, yeah. 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 I'm like the worst. Yeah. I'm like, I flourish in one-on-ones. Oh, interesting. I feel like I'm sort of like that too. And, and that day, not to like put the focus on, on, you know, like, all right, well, fuck, let's see how they do, you know? <laughs> but like when we were at Graham's, it was like, yeah, Likewise, like we could have fucking talked yeah. for hours and that's, that's that. Well, and we should of... preface by saying that the last time that we had hung out was a completely different experience. Uh, not true, to bring up. True. No, no, no. You told you're me right, later you were in right. kind of a bad headspace, yeah, 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 yeah. but we had hung out. I don't even, I want to say it was like 20. 2014, 2015. Somewhere yeah. around there. Yeah. Cause yeah. I was, me and Kelly were together at that point. Yeah. Uh, and I hadn't seen you since like graduation. So it had been yeah. like almost 10 years at that point. Oh, I know. And we went and played pool somewhere on Bank Street. And we went, we went to uh, Irene's. Oh, okay. On Bank, yes, we did. There was a band yeah, playing yeah, there as well. Yeah. yeah. yeah we went yeah, somewhere yeah. else to play pool afterwards at some yeah. upstairs location. And no. I remember feeling like, like terrible because I felt yeah. like, I felt like you just didn't enjoy my company. And then I was at some point you basically said that you were yeah. like, I was like, Hey, what's, what's going on here? And you're like, I don't really feel like there's a rapport here. And I was like, who the fuck says that to someone's face? But like, whatever, it's yeah. all fucking, you yeah. know, water under the bridge. I don't, yeah. I would, even at that night, I wasn't angry at you. I was more just like, I think I was disappointed in myself. Cause I thought I had done something wrong. Uh, no. But you've explained to me since that you were kind of in a weird spot in your life. No, and, I, and I'm glad you, I'm glad you brought that up. Cause like when I always, it's funny. I always had like a version of myself of like how I was going to progress and like who I was going to become like in my twenties. Mm. But the fact of the matter was that I was like, like Tony Robbins says this great line. It's like, so-and-so says they have nine years experience. It's like, no, you have like, nine years of doing the same thing over and you have one year experience, but you're doing the same thing mm. over and over again for yeah, nine years. Up and, up. Yeah. and, and I felt that way in my twenties. Like I was kind of, <clears throat> I was kind of like 
constantly at odds with myself. And this, this is kind of like getting to the root of like undiagnosed ADHD, which is laughable because I know it was diagnosed in high school and in high school it was like, yeah, you were on real me, all that. Yeah. Katie, Moncrief, like all of us ADHD crew. Yeah. yeah we had like the Dexedrin. <laughs> we were called the Dex crew. Oh really? We, were, I didn't we know had that. like, we had like a crew name. Um, and we were all, I mean, most of us were on medication, but like, Back then, ADHD medication was like street drugs. Mm. Like Dextrin had a bad rap. Ritalin was like the only thing. Adderall, Concerta, all those. Like none of them had, they they didn't really, if they existed, they weren't commercial and conventional. So Mm. I kind of like banished medication the moment I became like a free adult, 18, 19. Uh, I I don't need this anymore. Yeah, I don't need this anymore. I'm Mm. going to chef school. I'm just going to be like a rogue Anthony Bourdain, like badass cook, you know, and... You, you, didn't, know, and, you didn't think the ADHD it, would be a problem? I didn't think ADHD would be a problem for anything that like gave me stimulation, mm. which was smart. As long I was as you're like, focused on something. Yeah, yeah, I was on the right thread and the right course by that rationale because like kitchens are like, go, 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 go. But I didn't, there was all these other things from like a personal growth standpoint that I wanted to accomplish in my twenties. Uh, you know, that old, like 30 is the new 20. Yeah. And then there's Ted talks that are like, well, it doesn't have to be like, you can have your shit together in your twenties. Yeah. I'm very much the kind of like poster child of someone who just like, that just never happened. It Mm. was like a decade of just not just experimenting, but like, constantly like hitting all these different forks in the road and being, and even into my thirties, but like just being like, so going against the grain of like my temperament, what worked for me, what I actually wanted to do and getting back to what you were saying, like we met up right. Like one, we met up like, right when I turned 30 okay, and literally like, I remember that night and like a month later I lost my girlfriend, both of my jobs and my apartment all in 10 days. Holy shit. And they call that like your Saturn moon. Oh really? They call yeah. There's like I this you were thing. Say rock bottom or something. Well, there's that too, but there's this thing in astrology which I don't really know much about. But like my mom has been like forwarding emails. Yeah, my to me. mom's pretty. Yeah, <laughs> she, for she, like you know and e- exactly, stuff. <laughs> exactly. Your month ahead, your year ahead, <laughs> your whole friggin' life. You know, like you hear like mer- you know, Mercury you know, retrograde and all that shit. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. yeah, exactly. And and so like between that and then people that are also a little bit like hippie and spiritual and like your mom always like, seemed like a hippie to me. Well, totally. But sure. I've met like even like platonic girlfriends that will like pull out a pack of tarot cards oh, like yeah? at a party and like, yeah. So like, what are we doing tonight? A seance. Yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> exactly. So like I heard about this thing called your Saturn moon and, and yeah, like that looking back now, Cause I didn't even hear about it until I was in my mid thirties. And I was like, Oh man, that, that's what you were going through. That totally mm. happened to me. It was like a whole way of being and behaving and like your aura of energy. I was just like stuck. In well, a can bind. I ask, was there a point post this that you started taking medication again? Was the, do you no. think that was like a, oh, so no, you're still not. No. So like medication, like, so, and the reason why I even bring up ADHD, uh, well, it's a big part of your life. It's something huge, you dealt with. Yeah. huge part of my life. But like, you were telling me when you were a kid, people make you, made you feel really stupid. Like you yeah. were like the, oh yeah. Oh the yeah. Dumb kid or something. And For clearly sure. you're not, you're a very intelligent person. So 
Yeah, I mean, like it's it's <laughs> like, <laughs> well, like <laughs> well, like just like conventionally, right? Like like um like that Ken Robinson TED Talk. I don't know if you've seen it. Like no. kills uh how schools kill um creativity or whatever. It's like one of the early TED Talks that had like seven million views. That was like there were like these little moments in time where I would kind of like soak up external knowledge and information that would kind of like affirm to me that like, Oh yeah. Like, and then, and then like, I would just, I would just be like regurgitating quotes that I had heard from people. I'd be like, Oh yeah. Like intelligence is dynamic. And like, no, no, that's not intelligence. That's, that's education. So like, I never thought of myself as educated to this day. I don't even think of I myself think as you make that, a good point you know, though about like the institution of of school and high school and all that it is very broad and i wish we had a way to sort of narrow in on people's strengths at a younger age and encourage mm -hmm. those strengths i mean there is like if you're good at band hopefully you have a good band teacher who's like hey yeah you rock that clarinet solo but then you still yeah. have to go to gym class where some guy makes you feel like a fucking pussy because you can't dribble yeah, yeah, yeah. or whatever well, exactly. you know like and that's just one example it could be any subject that you, it's it's not good to feel like you suck at something on a mm -hmm. daily basis. And, and at yes, that age. well, adversity and failure is important. I'm not saying that you shouldn't have to struggle at all, but if there's something that you're like, for me, like math, I'm actually fairly good at it, but I fucking mm -hmm. hate the process. I just don't enjoy math. I always yeah. did. Okay. Yeah. But I hated every fucking minute of it. Yeah. And I think in grade 11 or 12, I was like, yeah, I'm done with I, math. I oh, think geez. we were in work. I think we were in workplace math together. We might've been. What is that? Like, um, people who are struggling. Cause I'm well? in the same boat. Not to go on a non sequitur tangent about math and science, okay. but, <laughs> but like, honestly, That's podcasting, man. Yeah. Like, on, honestly, like I, they introduced like a special workplace math that like taught you how to actually do like really important shit. Like, mm, like, like your taxes. Like, yeah. Like your taxes <laughs> and stuff. And like, just, I don't know the numbers breakdown of, of like, just like, saving for a car and like, yeah, I don't even remember that day-to-day class. -day budgeting and, and just, you know, numbers, like numbers that you will actually use in your life yeah, and not algebra. Like, yeah. 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 Like theoretical physics. Yeah. Or yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. I don't yeah. even remember careers class. I always thought that was kind of cool. It's like, here's yeah. how you make a resume. Yeah. Like that's the shit we should be learning. You yeah. Know? yeah. 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 Well, ex exactly. And, and honestly, man, I'm glad you brought that up. I, I found like, a pamphlet about like your career in the Canadian entertainment industry. Like, and I don't know if I got that it's old enough. And the pamphlet, the binder was like worn out enough that I swear I got it from like, Oh, three to Oh five. Like, so maybe not in that class, but like, I remember when I found it, I thought back to that class being like, okay, I was like 17 to 20 when I got this. Um, and yeah, like that, that, that and civics. And like, there were a few classes that like really made me think about who I am as an individual, where I'm going to fit in, how am I going to like build a life for myself where yeah, real world shit. Yeah, yeah where there's like a balance between like you know money and like being able to make a living and also like the expression of yourself mm -hmm. because i think when i graduated that was like the only real thing on my mind and i think chef school i think like why i fell into that was that like while we were doing theater and like, while I was acting Mr. Crossett, you know, and, and, and like, that was like the only, like music theater was like the only class outside of some liberal arts classes, um, like Mr. Parsons, who I think we uh, yeah. talked about. I'm trying yeah. to get him on the show. I don't yeah. know where he is. I don't uh, know like we gotta, but... we gotta find him. If, yeah. if he ever watches this episode, like 
he knows that we're thinking. I've about actually been yeah. um, thinking about calling the school and just seeing like on the off chance he still works yeah. there. Probably not, but maybe they know where he transferred to or exactly. So, yeah, I should say we went to exactly. Colonel By. Yeah, Colonel By Secondary School. Tom Green School. Yeah. Brian Adams went there. Yeah. As well. Tom um, Cruise had a brief stint either I th- I there he or Hopkins. Henry Monroe. Something like that. Yeah. 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 We've had some big names in Ottawa. Big names. Although Tom Cruise was Tom Maypother at the time. That's his real name. True. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I only learned that because yeah. there was a guy on Lost. When I used to watch Lost, I was really fucking into that show until they ruined yeah. it at the end. Yeah. Uh, and Tom Cruise's like cousin or brother or something was on that. And his last name was Maypo there. He kind of looked like a derpy Tom Cruise. No offense to this guy. Yeah. But uh, you could see the resemblance. And, and that was the first time I learned that. that yeah. Was like when when he uh, he was presenting an award or some sort of, I don't know, it could have been like some tribute or, or, you know, they do those like in memoriam things. Like there was some like moment in the Oscars and Tom Cruise like made reference to a moment in his life when he was in like Ottawa, Canada, like not, oh, yeah? not even Ottawa, Ontario, like Ottawa, Canada. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and, and he talked about like some cinematic, like movie going memory that he had with his family. Hmm. I wonder which theater and, it was. And <laughs> yeah, exactly. And it probably was Gloucester. It was probably in Well, like... the Gloucester theater used to be shitty back in the day. Like, I remember you brought... The one movie, strangely enough, I remember you bringing me there was Battlefield Earth, <laughs> which is a terrible <laughs> movie. And it's basically a Scientology movie. It's yeah. fucking L. Ron Hubbard. I remember... Yeah, you, do you remember that or no? You brought me to the, the Gloucester Center. I remember we saw that. Stupid Amazing. John Travolta with his yeah, shitty brain. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I remember <laughs> I, that came out it's in... A terrible uh, movie. 97 or something i want to say like between 97 and 99 i want to th- i i'm thinking 99 but i might be wrong speaking of tom cruise and what we we're talking about at the restaurant um about like all the famous movies i've never seen yeah this is relevant now because the sequel just came out never seen top gun yeah i heard the yeah. new one is like phenomenal it's, too. and i just popped on social media it was the first like kind of like shout out encouraging kind of i don't even have a lot of followers but i was just like Go see this movie. Like, do you now. have to have seen the original? Or no, will it still not be at awesome? all. Not at all. Okay. No, literally, like, I did a bit of a write up on Instagram about it. I I called it a blockbuster masterpiece, mm. and those are two terms it's hard to pull off. Yeah. Those are two terms that are rarely used together in the yeah. same sentence. But <laughs> literally, when you think about COVID. You think about uh, the multiplexes, the cinema houses, film exhibition, as we've always experienced it <clears throat> as being this like communal thing. And that all of a sudden being like axed. Yeah. All of us are at home. Took Spider-Man to bring it back. Everything's <laughs> VOD. Everything's streaming. It's like Top Gun was like the movie that we all needed but mm. didn't even know that we needed to like pull us all back in that seat whether it's IMAX or D-Box or X screen or all those gimmicky things I mean IMAX is legit I've never done D-Box I've always thought it was yeah it's like but like just literally is the type of movie where regardless of scene points it's like you can charge me whatever you want you can charge me twenty dollars <laughs> i will <laughs> willingly yeah <laughs> willingly take my money and go and sit because like that movie had been in development like they started the development of that movie in 2010 wow. when tony scott was still alive and val kilmer could have had a much yeah, more active role exactly you know, cancer yeah, yeah totally it was two he was years. in it or just a photo he of was in it he, he was, was in it yeah it was, it was oh no it was beautiful like they did it where and i don't spoilers spoiler alert yeah um they did it in a way where they were able to like loop the character of Iceman into the narrative. And then like, they just made his illness part of the narrative, part of the story world. Yeah. Yeah. So like, that's all you can really do at this point. That's all you can really do. But, but then like they made it very simplistic where Tom Cruise goes to meet ice. They have a very poignant moment. They hug they talk about so val kilmer does know, speak in it i thought he couldn't speak or something or his son was doing his lines or something like that they, they he add, does like the roger ebert 
Oh. Like, he does the, like, the typing. Like Stephen the Hawking Stephen stuff? Stephen Hawking's, oh. like, he does, like, the typing thing. Yeah. Shit. And then at the end, when you think that it's, like, he can't speak. Super spoiler like, alert. M- yeah. He, like, <laughs> musters up. Some, oh, he actually uh, did? Yeah. Uh, and he says a few lines. And then they hug. And then it's amazing. Wow. And then I think they, like, step away and then hug again. And you're just kind of like, oh, my God. It didn't is, feel like shoehorned amazing. into the plot, though. Like, it felt natural. No, 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 no. It, it, no, like, they, they had this, like, covert kind of, like, and this is, like, major spoiler, but, like, Tom, <laughs> Tom's kind of, like, there looped into this assignment, which I won't discuss. But, like, there's a whole kind of text thread going on with Ice that's, like, leading him there like the reason why he's on his mission is because he's been called upon Mm. by ice and it's all in this like iMessage thread type deal you know where you can see the like dot 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 like ice is typing something i remember when they fucking started doing that in movies because obviously they had to bring it in it's the world we live in but the first few movies i saw where they did that it felt so weird i was like really for sure it's in our movies now you know like i wanted to get away from smartphones and then (laughs) the stupid fucking noises yeah Yeah. totally um shit okay well this kind of touches on the fact that like you did do some film critic stuff right or you were doing write-ups? Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, like, um, fast forward past all the cooking. Um, we can get back to that. Yeah, I, yeah. and, and it's, it's like, <clears throat> those were those were dark years. I, like, barely want to go there. <laughs> okay, well, we uh, don't have to. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, those those were just kind of like, being a line cook is brutal, right? Yeah. Like, we all, unless unless you really, it's, like, harder than working in film. Because you just don't, you know, there's no money in it. And it's like, ugh. like the other day, not, not to like go on another tangent, but the other day I was like literally, uh, helping a buddy just make, um, like a commercial corporate video for a POS machine. And, uh, a POS, a POS, it kind of like, sorry, <laughs> like, a like, you know, like the square app. Like you oh, like turn oh, up like your the, card um, and like method method of payment and everything. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, point of sale. That's probably point of sale. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Not a piece of shit. Yeah, <laughs> that's yeah. Right. Sorry, that's like an inside term. Of course, um, yeah. Pos lingo, yeah. yeah. Um, and and yeah, the restaurant owner was just kind of like after COVID, like we've got a there's like a whole new generation and new wave of line cooks. Mm. That are like all the old guys that used to do it when the pandemic hit, they were kind of like, you know what? I've had yeah. enough of this. Yeah, yeah. This is too hard. Or and like, now there's no customers. And, yeah, yeah. Either like I've been let go or I'm taking a look at my life and like the work to salary balances off or I want to spend more time with my family mm. or I just need a change or whatever. And now there's just a whole new generation of you know, young people going to culinary school and getting out. And, and, and that really made me think like, yeah, like hospitality is, uh, is going to go through a little bit of, of a new wave Renaissance. And like, Hmm. cause I, I feel like when we, and I know, I, I know I'm really delving into this, but, but I, I think about this a lot. I think about how, like, when we graduated high school and we were all like almost 20 fucking years ago. Yeah. (laughs) And, and like, we were, we were like, we were like 23, 24 in like 2008, 2009. We were young enough that if we hadn't gone to university right away and majored in something very specific, Mm. Like in hindsight, they told you to do like the people that got <laughs> Your jobs, guidance counselor, yeah. you know, like the people that got jobs during the initial recession yeah. of 08, 09, the people that like majored in like bioscience or like whatever, like they got jobs, yeah. but the people that like might have taken a few years off. Yeah, still like, deciding, still figuring things or, out. Yeah, like the yeah. the Bob Dylan's, you know, blowing in the wind, <laughs> like like I was. I was this like line line cook, 
you know, writer, actor, like one day I'll be a filmmaker, kind of mm. like bohemian type dude who was like, oh, I've got, I've got time. I've got, that was always, that, It'll was, work always, out. that was always my mantra in my twenties. Like I've got time. And, and, and <laughs> like, about right. you know, and then like, bam, like that shit happens. And then by 2011, 2012, 2013, it just felt like all of my friends worked in restaurants. Oh yeah. But yeah, because after, after, after the recession, it was just kind of like, there was a huge elliptical period where like people just couldn't find white collar jobs. And it just seemed like everybody in my peer group was like not only working in restaurants, but they were just totally okay with like that kind of, they didn't even call it a day job and they didn't even look at it the way I look, I looked at it as a real like means to an end. Mm. I was like, all right. pay the bills I was like yeah. yeah, I was like, fuck, okay, I'm doing it, but like, I'm not building anything. Yeah. This Where is, is not this what going? I, yeah, yeah. This is not what I want. And from, from that, you know, massive peer group of people, like there were some people that like, they were like, fuck it, man, I'm going all the way. Like, no, mm. no, 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 this is not a day job. This is not like, you know, a part-time job to me. This is my life. I want to be a sommelier. I want to be like, my buddy is like literally like goes to world championships and like mixology and bartending. Oh, wow. And like, I know. But this is an insanely you know, hard industry to yeah. like excel at really. hundred like, percent. What you're saying is how many people, how many line cooks are there for every one guy who's like a Gordon Ramsay or whatever, yeah. you know? I mean, I, I suppose if you're working, if you really love working in a restaurant, the goal is to eventually own your own, I would, I would imagine, yeah. and, and maybe cook for fun at that point. But like, you, you're more just running the place. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, like if you just love cooking, there's not a lot of room for success or like massive success, I would say, you know, you can get by, you can pay the bills, but it's not, yeah. I could tell you're stri you were striving for something larger than that, you know? Yeah. I mean, I just, I've... <sighs> God, I mean, I fell into it in the weirdest way where like I literally chose cooking as like a backup plan for like the arts mm. in the way that like. It was like your stable job. Yeah, and it's kind of like in my mind, it was like it was already an art. It was already like physical. I knew that. I think I knew that I could never sit and do a desk job, mm. which is typical of most like, you know, artistic people or yeah, yeah. Pe people on the spectrum. It's like, you I can't them. even do like Monday to Friday. That makes me want to blow my brains out. The idea of like yeah. 8 a.m. Monday, I'm working yeah. for the weekend. Like, totally, pff, totally. No, I can't. And if we roll long enough, like I'll <laughs> tell you about like once I was in my early to mid thirties. Like I, I did that. I did that. I did it. I finally did a nine to five desk job for two years. Well, did you hate every and, minute of it? <laughs> and, and it was, I mean, it was, it was a, it was a bit of a balance cause it was like, it was studio management, property management. So I was kind of on my feet a little yeah. bit, but it was for a corporate real estate company. It was for a company that I never thought in a million years that I would ever work for. But yeah, like, like I went through a long stint of like 10 years as a line cook. And then after that decided, wait a second, like line cooks make no money. Why did I pick cooking? I should be a yeah. server. And then I started serving and bartending and, Get tips and, and, and stuff. Yeah. getting tips. That was that was 2012. And to get back to film theory, um, in 09, when I was still cooking, I I just started a university degree while I was still cooking part-time, but I just like started working towards a film degree. Cause film I studies knew, at Carlton. yeah, exactly. I mean, we were all in Ottawa. I was in Ottawa at that point and there was no film production. That's another thing where like, it's, it's not frustrating, but it's kind of like, it, it was a bummer. <laughs> <laughs> it was a big Lombowski bummer that, that like, you know, back, back when we, uh, got out of 
high school. There was there was nothing. there wasn't much of an industry for that here. Yeah, no. like there was TV broadcasting, and the TV broadcasting uh, bar exam was all about current affairs and news mm. and. No, what's a very political city? Total, and yeah. I tanked. I remember I showed up to that exam, and I bombed. I wanted to be like writing about like tracking shots and James Cameron and, yeah. and you know Scorsese and like I wanted to like talk film and they were like asking me who the prime minister was and mm. I just was like oh my god well, you should probably know that <laughs> I think it was Paul Martin at the time okay, yeah. but like I tanked and I didn't get in and I got into screenwriting and I got into theater and I got into graphic design and I got into chef training. But because I was dishwashing at Les Fougères mm. in Chelsea, yeah. that fine cuisine spot, it was like path of least resistance. Mm. It was like, and I think other people in my circle were like, oh, dude, like just act on the side. Like you're not going to become an actor. Yeah. And then writing, it was just kind of like, if you want to write, just write. But like cooking, it just seemed like a bird in hand. It seemed like, okay, yeah, yeah. I'm going to get a skill set and then I'm going to get a job. It's funny because, I mean, I wish, I mean, I always say that you get less and less risk averse uh, or like more and more risk averse as you get older. You're like less down to like take that Chances. that chance yeah, yeah. to be like, oh, I'm going to backpack across Europe when I'm 40. Like, no, you're not. You're going to do that yeah. when you're 19. You have 19. responsibilities. You have, yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, but I was still like, I think, I think parents and friends and everything might have been in the mix, but but not fully. Like, my parents were always supportive. They mm. were always like, go for it. And and I very much was like. I loved my restaurant crew and I wanted to stay with them and I got in and I went for it. And it was like years and years of my life donated to just like Grinding. become, yeah, yeah, yeah. And making like $14 an hour. And feeling kind of empty at the end. Yeah, yeah. And feeling drained and like not knowing, like not having any energy to write. There was. How many no, people does that happen to where they get like sidetracked by the sort of what's meant to be the interim plan. Like, Oh, I'm just going to do this for the time being, yeah. but my art is the real. And then yeah. the art just dissolves and they end up like, you know, 60 all of a sudden they're still working at Walmart or whatever. hundred percent, hundred percent. And it's, and it's funny because like, I don't even, um, I don't even kind of like, uh, denote cooking as being like the thing that deterred me. I think it was like the seed to like a certain mindset that factored in a plan B mm. because the funny thing is, is that was only the beginning. That was 2003, 2006, 2007. In that period, I was already leaving Le Fougere to give it my first kick of the can to like be a stand-in, a background performer, yeah. like an extra. Give it the old college try. Yeah, getting a, yeah. like a set PA job. I was already like trying to get work in film. And I did. I remember I got, I got my first gig um, in February 2007 when I was 21 as a stand-in actor for a lead um, – Nina, what's her name? Nina Dobro. Oh, the chick from Degrassi. From, and, yeah, um, and Vampire, Vampire Diaries. Yeah yeah. yeah, yeah. She was the female, uh, like female the lead. Yeah. yeah, and it was like me and this girl Mercedes were two stand-ins for Nina and this guy Dylan Casey, who was like a big CBC. He was in that show like VIP or whatever. He was like just to clarify, stand in would be like if if they need someone to be in the shot, but it's just like the back of their head or yeah, whatever. Okay. Yeah, for lighting purposes, you're like you're not on camera. You're not like a driving double or a photo double. You're oh, just okay, like, okay. You're literally just a body for someone to talk to. So yeah, you're in the scene, or the whatever. director mm. of photography, the cinematographer calls second team, and second team are usually a male and female literally just like 
body. I, I want to say talent. <laughs> and you are, you are a talent. Like, pardon me on the, on the call sheet, you are technically more categorized as talent, certainly more as talent than crew, but you are literally just like a human vessel that yeah. arrives. Well, dude, I did security stands. for 10 years yeah. and they make you feel like you are like the line of defense between calamity and whatever. But really in most of the positions, you're just keeping a chair warm, Yeah, you know, yeah. And, and it's hard to feel like you're really doing much. You yeah. Know? Totally. Watching some DVD of Superbad overnight yeah. at three yeah, in the morning. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I'm protecting everyone. Yeah, you know? exactly, exactly. Okay. And, and that was I, my my cooking school for the record, or cooking yeah. experience. Like what you said for ten years of just grinding it as a line cook. That was mm -hmm. me with security. I did okay. I did commission errors for like nine years, and it was yeah. By the end, I fucking hated it. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. In yeah. a way, where actually I became much more bold. Like I, it was a security company that was all or mainly ex-military it was exclusively ex-military until like 2000 and they started letting anyone apply at that point and i was one of the first like non like veterans so i was constantly coming up against um alpha males who were like mm. um not comfortable very insecure about the fact that they were in like this rent-a-cop position but they used to be a sergeant or whatever the fuck their glory days or whatever yeah. so there, there was a lot of like um short man complex constantly yeah, and I took yeah. it for so long. And then I got in the last year, I didn't really care about the job anymore. Cause I started working at the hospital. It paid way better. And I was kind of just, you know, doing the odd shift here or there. And I finally had nothing to lose. And I started kind of just like standing up to these types. And I realized mm. it was just a house of cards. Most of them were so full of it. They're so just yeah. used to like, I don't know, just being a dick and people taking it that yeah. like when someone finally said like, no, like, and you just push back a little bit, most of them gave, gave up right away. It was very interesting. Yeah. 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 And that's funny. Like you literally run into temperaments just like that. Uh, certainly in kitchens, but, but also in On film, film sets. I was yeah. going to say, yeah, for sure. Those like, egos like goes abound. Oh my God. Like just, and just old union guys that have like talked down to youngsters, mm. the assistant of the assistant of the assistant and forgetting that, when they first came yeah, in. Yeah, exactly. Know, yeah. And the same thing with comedy, the, you get that. Concept. Yeah. Yeah. And that department had just, yeah, totally. No, I know it's, it's, um, I think that's a natural reaction when you're getting to sort of like, you know, the, the dusk period of your career. Mm -hmm. I think that it's a lot of people, it's like a defense mechanism to, be kind of condescending and dole out wisdom that no one's asking for and stuff. Cause you're like, yeah. this is all I have left. Like I'm yeah. the wise sage at this point, please listen to me, validate me. Yeah. We all want validation, but I, I do think that's, that's kind of par for the course when you get to the, the glory days or sorry, the not glory days, but the, you know, the last days of your yeah, career. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, something that I think we're probably all going to be the guilty legacy, of. the legacy days. Yeah, well, it's because it's, like, it's hard when, when you're someone who's been through a lot, whatever the industry is, and you've seen a lot and you've weathered all these different situations, and then you see some cocky little upstart kind of just think they know fucking everything and they're 21 yeah. and you're like, oh, I want to punch you in the face so yeah. bad, whatever your yeah. industry. Um, yeah. But, you know, there's a balance there because I think that every one of those old guys who's giving that <laughs> condescending advice was that upstart spunky little kid at one point yeah. and, and you forget that and you lose touch with that version of yourself. And I think that really finding that sweet spot somewhere in, in the middle where you yes. have the patience and the understanding and, and all that side of experience, but you don't lose that enthusiasm, you know? And, and, oh man, I have so much to say on that. That, that is like, <laughs> that is, that is brilliant. And, 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 and my teacher right now, um, uh, this guy that's kind of like showing me the ropes for, for like commercial directing right now. He he talks about that. He's, it's like this balance between like your, your like confidence and your ego, but also, also your humility. Yeah. Um, and openness and yeah, yeah. Every teacher I've ever had, uh, for directing has all kind of touched upon this thing where like, if in the end it is your decision why not listen to everybody? Yeah. Why not be an open book Yeah. and listen to all of your crew and all of your cast? Cause they all have great ideas. Think about all the great you know? advice you might've not received because of where, what your standpoint that you were receiving things at, at that point, you know, like yeah. you're going through a shitty day or, or you're just stubborn or naive or whatever it is. And like, there's probably so many moments where, 
if, if we had that openness, we could be really absorbing useful information and experience, but we all have our egos just getting in the way constantly. I don't know. Yeah. 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 Totally. And, and honestly, like I just to touch on that, like 21 year old kid who thinks that, you know, he or she knows everything. Like, like I, I actually in film, maybe not so much in cooking because cooking there, there really is a foundation that needs to be learned and there, well, I would say, isn't that true about film as well? Well, there isn't that much room for egos in the kitchen. Mm. Like you really, and there, there is like a learning curve, but with film, like, I guess it's artistic. There's a lot of experimentation in film. It's not always. Yeah. That like Robert Rodriguez, 10 minute film school thing that he does where like he, I don't know. I don't know. I'm not familiar. No. Oh man. He's. He's a legend. Like he's. The oh, guy. I know who he is. Yeah, I just didn't know yeah, about this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So like film. he made El Mariachi for like ten, uh, seven thousand dollars and Rebel Without a Crew, and then he went on to have this like docu series about like the ten minute film school. He's convinced that you can learn filmmaking in like ten minutes, and I mean that's that's a bit of a stretch. In a nutshell, or whatever. Yeah, yeah but like honestly, so much of film, in, from a formal standpoint can be learned very quickly, but your persona, how you brand yourself, Mm. your confidence, all the nuanced stuff. Yeah. yeah, Just like your niche and your signature, like personal brand. This is something I never really understood when I was younger, but like you have to put yourself in a box to a certain degree. You have to let the external world know what it is, like what the heck are you all about? What it is that you do? What is your brand? And then you kind of have to like stick by it because Mm. there's going to be a lot of external forces being like, are you a director? Are you an actor? Like, are you a screenwriter? Especially in Canada where there's not a lot of like what we call above the line jobs. Mm. There's not a lot of like homegrown signature Canadian content made in this country that like gets mass distribution and like gains traction. So like whatever it is, your signature brand, your production company, whatever, whatever it is that you're all about, like you have to stick to your guns. So like, you know, like what's her name? God, this masterclass, I'm Mira Nye. Like, like you have to be, you have to, she has this great line. You have to have the heart of a poet, but the skin of an elephant. And, Uh, and I love that. Right. What does mean? Like, uh, like being tough and yeah. And I think, I think I mentioned like temperament and sensibility as like one of the first things I wanted to talk about because it's, it's paramount. It's paramount. It's like the reason why. I've gone so long in my career, like still wrestling with myself because it's like eventually that imposter syndrome has to fade away. Eventually you have to like let the anxiety go and be like, no, like all that aspiring, all that school, all that knowledge, like it's done you're ready. Like, like, yeah. like Steven Pressfield has this great line, like start before you're ready. You can wait. And like tomorrow is never going to come. And eventually yeah. you just have to like brand yourself, like whatever it is that you like, hi, my name is fill in the blank. I am an actor. I am a screenwriter. I'm yeah. a director. I'm a producer. I am any one of the jobs that all the young kids want when they get out of film school, but they are the jobs that are synonymous with delay of gratification, Mm. which is something that millennials struggle with the most. (laughs) It's like, you're going to get out of film school and your parents are going to be like, well, fuck, you know, you should probably get a job in film. And you basically have two routes. It's like you either go the like new school contemporary DIY, like vide- yeah. videographer route. Make a movie on your and iPhone. You, well, no, it's like you just start making branded content for companies and everything. Oh, and, like, okay. and, and like you become one of those guys on Instagram that's just like sponsored ad. Yeah. Like I'm a 25 year old guru who can like show you how to Like you literally like, yeah. did you notice that during the pandemic? It was like all of, all of the people that, 
probably themselves couldn't find clients. They are just like, oh, I'm just going to flip it. So I'm going to be the person teaching other anxious people that want to find clients how to find clients. Yeah. It's that old, like, how to make a living as a filmmaker. I know. I'll teach other filmmakers how to make a living as a... <laughs> and it's a mind fuck. And you can't... And if anybody is listening, like... You can watch the free webinar, but like, don't fucking punch in your visa card number. Cause like, <laughs> there's literally no difference between you and them. Yeah. It's just, they have the fucking, this is their angle. Now. They have the yeah. gall and the fucking chutzpah to be like, you know, I have the audacity to just like yeah. hire a copywriter on Fiverr to just like make, make this whole like sales pitch proposal this never ending web page that scrolls <laughs> all the way down to like a PayPal entry, you know, yeah. point of sale, you know, yeah. but yeah, no, it's, it's like, that is the new route or you can like get a job like I did as a production assistant and just like on the hopes that you'll, you Eat know, yeah, exactly. Yeah. But like, regardless, that's kind of like the way that you would make money, but like, the real truest thing that you can do is to just like continually make films, your own short films, whether they be, you know, commercials are almost like short films now. Yeah. There's a huge wave of like commercial content for brands also being somewhat narrative based and, and fiction based documentaries or just your standard, you know, short film um, or experimental film or whatever. Yeah, which can be anything. Yeah. Exactly. But like constantly building just like you in this podcast, like, like building something where at the end of the day, something remains. Yeah. That's, you know, you know yeah, that, yeah. you know that feeling where like your energy and your time and has amounted to something. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Your action, that feeling where, and I've like, just like meditated on this for like 10,000 hours, like, like the Malcolm Gladwell theory. Like I'm, I'm in the camp of like overthinking where I've just been mulling over, like, how does my brain feel when I procrastinate or I spend all day researching or I take a job that I know might lead to like, contacts or like I might get to work with certain people in the industry that I want to work with, yeah. but I'm not building anything of intrinsic value for me. Yeah, yeah. At the end of the day, is there a script? No. Is, yeah. is, am I in the editing room with a short film? No. No, well, so, you're a creator, right? I, I would have said that's as, I, as I long am, as I've known you, you I have am. that in you. But like, it's, it's this balance in Canada where it's like, if there's not a lot of jobs for filmmakers and there's only so many people that get telefilm and arts council grants. And I talk about this with, with my peer group all the time. Like you have to hit certain check boxes to like get tele telefilm. Telefilm doesn't always go to like people who just want to make. What is that like, like a grant? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Telefilm Canada is the big one. There's like Harold Greenberg and, and there's it's all different be like channels. Canadian content. Yeah. Like, like national screen Institute is one. Like there's various like channels and funding bodies that you can go through. But None like, for comedy. The, but, the Canadian yeah. government doesn't consider comedy an art form. Just wanted to throw yeah, that out there for yeah. people that don't and know. That's, Pretty fucked up. But, but <laughs> well, here's, and here's another thing that's interesting. It's like when, when there's nothing and not to say that there's less people doing comedy, but when there's less, let's say for instance, um, there's less options when there's less options and less routes to take. And it's just kind of like you and a blank slate. You might be more prone to just starting small and just like taking that first step on the staircase yeah, to you're not discover so overwhelmed your, ex by exactly a myriad of choices. Exactly. Yeah. And I think back to the last six or seven years, I don't even know if moving to Toronto was the right choice. A mm. funny thing happened when I went to TIFF the first first year I was in Toronto. 
all of my favorite films by first time feature filmmakers, they had either gone home to their native hometown in Canada, like Ashley McKenzie, who made uh, werewolf. She's based in Cape Breton. A lot of people, a lot of amazing filmmakers in Canada that have either got distribution or gone to TIFF. A lot of them have gone home to the Maritimes mm. to make their features or Manitoba or, or, you know, Alberta or whatever. And it's really, really interesting because like you need, you need like, it's not just friends and family and like that, that holistically it has to be that like support system where there's something. And to this day, I think about it. I'm like making a first feature in Toronto seems impossible, but going home to Ottawa and Chelsea, like Ottawa Gatineau and making that first feature, why does that seem so doable? Yeah. But making it in Toronto. Well, I would assume it's more expensive to do anything in Toronto. Yeah. But like, it's like the things what I'm getting at is like the things that lead us to these big cities to pursue uh, careers in arts or entertainment or anything outside of like, cause you know, Ottawa, it's a government town, yada, yeah. yada, you know, like, like grass is always greener. I, you know, you go to Toronto and you think that your way that, that, that there's something that Toronto is going to give you mm. for that, like, allowance and permission and, like, the doors. The missing ingredient in the recipe. Exactly. Like, yeah, yeah. like the doors are going to open and, like, but, like, it no. It all makes sense now. Yeah. <laughs> it's, like, it's not. In, in 2022, that's not what it's about. No, it's, I, I you know? like, I get the the general feel of what you're getting behind here is like something that we were talking about Piotr or Peter uh, and yeah. who came on here episode like 14 and that was one of the things he said to me even when the show that was the episode before Strombo came on so I hadn't had any like huge name guests or anything it, mm -hmm. it was really very we're still amateur but it was just starting out 76 subscribers or whatever it was yeah but he still said that he liked he's like I'm down whenever someone's doing something making something yeah like just like, I like that you're just doing this, you yeah. know? And I was like, oh, shit, yeah. I've thought about that a lot since he said that. And and probably some of those older episodes, I would cringe trying to watch myself in, in episode four or whatever. You know, like, I've grown a lot, I'd like to think, as a host. But you have to start somewhere. You got to yeah. get yourself out there. And yeah. what you were saying about um, having so many options that you don't know which way to go, uh, that made me think of board games because there's a lot of complex games where uh, a term I hear used is analysis paralysis, where, like, totally. you're just... yeah you're so indecisive because there's just too much to choose from. You know, yeah. I get that just from anxiety. Even if I'm at the grocery store, I'm sure I've used this example before, but I'll be like, just trying to pick a cereal and there's like 47 different kinds of cereal. And sometimes yeah. I'll stand there for like 10 minutes. I'm like, I don't fucking know. Like, yeah. and, and then I feel like a dipshit after like, why didn't I just grab one? Why don't I just, you know, seize oh, the day? Yeah. Oh yeah. But, I mean, literally like I've been that guy at like 3 AM at Metro, just like staring at like a row of different. Yeah. Disclaimer. Pastas, I may have been high, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, can we actually, I know you were the one saying that, um, you might have to take a leak. Yeah. Um, but it's me, yeah. man. I gotta, okay. I gotta put a yeah, pin yeah, in yeah, it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Totally. Okay. Well, we're back in it. Pee break accomplished. So uh, I have no idea where we were, but uh, we got to wrap it up pretty quick because my dad's got to drive to Toronto tomorrow. Um, yeah. So let's, I'm sure we're going to miss tons of stuff I wanted to talk to you about, but. Um, you don't have to wrap it up super fast. Oh, no, you're good? Okay. Well, um, while we're talking about film then, I did want to say I saw a couple of your short films. One mm -hmm. of them was actually about uh, Les Fougères, that restaurant. There was a, a guy who worked there. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that was a short doc. Yeah, short documentary. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they were beautifully shot. But the other one was... That uh, one was, but... but Rail Path, though. I, I enjoyed that as oh, well. Oh, yeah, yeah. Did and, you see that one? Yeah, yeah and that yeah. girl was a dead uh, doppelganger for um, Brie Larson. She looks so oh, much like Brie Larson. I think she looks like Mary Stuart Masterson. I from like that is. From, like, Benny and June. I like know way back. of the movie, yeah. but I've never this seen This is like it. 80s or this is like Brad Pack era. Oh, but okay, I think okay. she looks, yeah. Anyways, She's yeah, they were both, the, I liked yeah. uh, the angles you got and everything. And, and you directed that one as well. I directed that one. Um, Charlie, who's the lead, uh, she's an actress based in Calgary. Uh, she wrote it and produced it. My buddy Nick shot it. 
Um, yeah, that was like, it was very intimate. Yeah. Like was, and that actually, that's kind of like experimental narrative. Cause that has like a little bit of doc. Mm-hmm. Um, it's kind of like, well, at the beginning you feel like it's like a documentary, but I learned, or I, I gathered later on that it was acting yeah. and, and oh, they were yeah. playing roles. But at the beginning, I didn't think that at all. When I first saw her at the, the onset, I thought, okay, this is some sort of like, Oh yeah. Reality. It, it, yeah, exactly. You know, it, it comes, it totally comes off that way. Yeah. I love that shot too of them on the bed, like the sort of like fly on the wall mm-hmm. thing you did. Those were mm-hmm. cool. Yeah. And I mean, honestly, like not, to speak ill of the film but like it (laughs) and not ill like licensed to ill but like um we looking back on that i mean i'll say that that narrative film was like one of the films that i made that had the most planning like Charlie and I actually like met and had like a lot of meetings and everything and no not nothing nothing formal like the formal aspects of the just film. discussing it all, but like content, mm. like character and like the script and everything. And there was, there was a lot and it's, and, and, and I'm glad you mentioned those two films because like they are, they are like the only things that I've made in recent years, um, outside of, of, of a commercial that I did recently that, that, that was like, planned Mm. and and if i say anything about my workflow and film like before we wrap things up is like that that like when you have adhd your your executive function which lives in your frontal lobes that's prefrontal cortex that is like the place in your brain where planning occurs and if there's anything that myself i'm so guilty of this and most novice newcomer finding their way filmmakers where most people shit the bed is that they totally disregard pre-production it is a thing it is like it is just yeah, it's just they just a, show up the day of like yeah, we're gonna yeah. do this. It's it's <laughs> indicative of uh the onset of digital cinema. Mm. It's like we all have digital cameras. Let's just show up and shoot. Yeah. And and as much as I love YouTube channels that um that like center and are focused around like discussing a really important thing or like tutorials about stuff that isn't really talked about that much. Like there's, there's certain niches of YouTube channels that I like, but in general, the videography, YouTube vlogging, very like just, DIY contemporary video stream of, of like content creator. I, I'm, I hate it. Like I, I'm, <laughs> I'm, a, stop. I'm, yeah, I fucking hate it. Like I'm a purist. I okay. really, I think, I think it's really, really dangerous because it's a slippery slope. Yeah. Yeah. I, I like literally like doing deep work, like t- taking, film like there's like it's a movie and like high concept and like you know jaws and back to the future like there's there is a formulaic high concept way of looking at cinema where like you see the movie poster and you don't even have to see the movie like it's it's all been pre-packaged for you Mm. and you know what it's gonna and that that was that was like a thing that happened in the eighties with like high concept films with, with, you know, all the, (laughs) you know, with everything that's, you know, with all those like Reaganite escapism movies of the eighties, you know, but cinema, like, like real, like, like filmmaking is, is what I think and call me sentimental, call me old school, poetic, whatever. But like, 
from like a writer director standpoint, you're like taking an idea of like how you see the world and what you want to say and all the external stimulus, everything that has made you who you are up until that point in the movie. And that is running in parallel with the times, all the like movies are always a product, a social political, like product of the 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 times. Exactly. So it's like the filmmaker, their internal life, their psyche, and then the external all amalgamated into like one cultural product and mm. it's deep work. It's like what we call deep a work. real art. Yeah. Yeah. Like you're in flow. But state, I mean, I would argue, isn't, know? isn't there room for, for all of it though? Because it's, it's there in is. the same sense there that is. like, um, you're not going to compare like Beethoven's whatever symphony to like, I'm a Bobby girl, <laughs> like whatever. Yeah, but there's totally. room for both of them because totally. somebody's fucking rocking out to Aqua, hundred percent. And someone's, 100%. you know, Chopin I just, is their guy. I or think, <laughs> I just <laughs> think terrible. it's, I think it's fascinating that like when I moved to Toronto, like Toronto, Toronto Film School advertising was like, you know, a dude on a dolly, dolly track, like big crew, the whole nine you know, with the viewfinder, massive camera. I got to work in the movies. And and yeah, come work in the movies. You know, now it's literally like a dude with a gorilla pod and a DSLR looking like he's Casey Neistat. And it's like, come to so many references. I just come. Well, like, like, like vlogging, right? You talk about, yeah, really like low, low, um, not low, but low complexity tech setup. It's just video. It's like, come to Toronto film school and launch your career in like video content production type deal. Yeah. Which falls into like, I don't know, like new media or whatever. Is there room for all of it? Totally. But, but that's not your cup of tea. I get but it. Yeah. No, I'm I'm looking at everything like that, like Jean Renoir, super famous filmmaker, has this amazing line, like learning is all about being able to like see the relationships between things. Mm. And and like John Lennon talks about the same shit. It's like and even fucking um getting back to Tom Cruise, it's like Jerry Maguire. It's like the things we think but do not say. Like when he, I've remember never when seen he, Jerry McCoy. you never seen ah, that's one of the movies. I haven't but seen he, like, so many he famous stay, movies. He stays Cameron Crowe, nineteen ninety six. You guys, I know see the it. film. I'm yeah, very yeah. aware of Jerry McGuire. But like, Just it's like show me the money. It's like <laughs> when you're so not enraged, but like you're so prone to say something that you feel so passionate about that you'll stay up until 4 a.m. writing a manifesto about it. Mm. And like, that's what he does. And it's more about like, you know, sports and sales. And you like filmmakers who are like fully consumed by the process of the art form. And, and yeah. And, and it's more like I'm, I'm voicing these ideas because this more traditional path of independent narrative filmmaking is now becoming like underground. It's falling by the wayside. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Like literally every single person on their iPhone and every stream and, and platform of social media is now going more and more video. And like, we're all technically filmmakers to some degree, whether we're like filming our dog or our friggin' dessert Fair, or yeah. whatever. Yeah. Uh, but like, it's just more noise. Yeah. And like, there's a lot of cultural theorists, like, like 13 years ago, Andrew Keen, who's this brilliant, um, cultural theorist from the UK was interviewed on press pause play, which was a groundbreaking documentary on, uh, the digital revolution. And he basically back then in 2009 was convinced that we might be going into like a dark ages of arts and culture. Hmm. And I like, I'm not agreeing with him a hundred percent. I just think, I just think that it's really, really interesting this idea that like year after year, there's going to be more and more noise. There's going to be more and more meaningless content that is attracting eyeballs 
because it's 15 seconds yeah. and it's oh, literally it. releasing more dopamine. Yeah. It's just right there, readily available on your phone. A bunch of shit and you didn't know you needed to see, but now yeah, you're like, wow, yeah, look at that gorilla yeah. go or whatever. <laughs> yeah. And, and I'm not even worried for the art form. I'm worried because the 16 year old boy who doesn't even know that he might have wanted to be the next, the next Scorsese. Ridley Scott or, or exactly. whatever. Yeah, yeah. I don't his, know, I chose him. But his or player. her brain is actually changing watching TikTok videos. Yeah. You know? So, like, there, hmm. I would argue there is going to be a smaller and smaller camp and percentage yeah. You know, like fucking Tarantino, Godard, like a band apart, that yeah. his production company, that's what it's going to be in 20 years, I think. Wow. The people that actually like make long format feature films on their own, because we're, we're, there's a pretty big distribution problem for like long, long format films. Like it is very hard, especially in Canada to recoup your money mm. from making a feature film. And like the odds of building that career and then just like how we're living our lives and how we're ingesting content. I don't know about you, but like, I know that when I was, 21, 22, 2006, 2007, even though I struggled with ADHD or whatever and working in kitchens Stay or whatever, and stuff, yeah. the culture, the external culture, the stimulus, the whole like digital orbit around me was like basically still analog. It was basically yeah. non-existent. I didn't have high speed internet. Cell phones I were lived, like, yeah, I had a Motorola phone. razor or something. Yeah, yeah totally. Yeah. If you ask me to sit down with a legal pad and just write my heart out about an idea that could be, I don't know, a 10 or 15 minute short film proof of concept for a longer film. You would have had the passion. I, and, yeah. Like yeah. I, I just think I would have had the like cognition and like, and like focus and I found, okay, no, this synapse, is actually really you interesting. You're saying yeah. this because I was cleaning out a basket. I have a bunch of crafts and old shit in and you know, it's getting pretty full. So I looked through and I found all these old notebooks from maybe like five years ago. It was probably when I was first getting into comedy and there was a bunch of jokes where I was like, wow, this is funny. I never even said this on stage. Like it was so interesting to look at that stuff from almost like a different standpoint where like, mm -hmm. it's almost like I hadn't even written it cause I forgot mm -hmm. about it. Yeah. But it also made me realize like, holy fuck, I was writing stuff back then. I, I don't know. Not that I'm not productive or whatever. I try my best, but I do feel like there's, I don't know that social media energy is like sapping a part of us away totally. and so yeah. like dissolving this thing that was ample. I don't know. Maybe part of it. I always try to tell myself though, it's just partially we're just getting older and you know, everyone looks at like their childhood, like the nineties for us is like this nostalgic, like we, we see it through rose colored lenses. It's, you know, there was yeah. nothing wrong with it, but but people in the nineties, like my dad would have been a grown up back then. He was probably thinking about the seventies that way or whatever. Like, I think we're, there's a little yeah. bit of that no matter what is, it's just like, this isn't what I grew up with and that's scary and weird. And, and, you know, so I try to tell myself that, but social media seems like a different creature altogether. We're like, no, is. I think it this is. is actually a game changer. Like this is not just social media, but like smartphones and the whole digital, whatever you want to call it from the last 10 ish years since smartphones yeah. really rolled out. Smartphones is the thing. Yeah. That's the one that really fucking changed everything. Yeah. And I don't think in a good way. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> like I'm, I'm ask any one of my friends, I'm like ferociously nostalgic. Like I'm kind of like Gil Pender in Midnight in Paris. Like I'm a little bit like Owen Wilson's character. Keep naming I'm movies I've never seen. <laughs> I'm, well, just to your point of like, you know, when, when you're like in the twenties, you're his characters in the twenties and there's people dreaming about, you know, the 1800s. Yeah. And when you're in uh, the eighties, so-and-so's thinking about the sixties or like whatever. Um, I'm very much like that. I'm constantly thinking about like, like my parents, my parents were together 
briefly, I actually have movie ideas about this, but they're expensive. Uh, my parents were together in 68 and my mom got pregnant and she had an abortion and I always daydream about what my life would have been like if I was born in 68. Oh, Ob would it have been you though, right? Obviously, I wouldn't have been born and I would have been like a different person. I wouldn't even yeah. be here right now, but like I always just That's crazy. Because I'm because I'm an only child and my parents literally like lost each other for 17 years, and then, found each other oh, again, crazy. got pregnant again and, That's had, a movie for and sure. had one kid and that one kid was me. Yeah. I always just like dial the clock back and was like, well, wait, like what if it wasn't 1985? Mm. What if it was 1968? That's and, so and, cool. And you know what I mean? That's like, a trip, yeah. What if I was 20? Like, that's the year Robert Rodriguez was born, 68. Like, what if I was, what if I was friggin' 20 years old in 1988? You know, yeah. like, what if I was fucking breakdancing in the 80s? Oh, dude, I take like, that further. You know? Like, I sometimes think about what it would have been like to be born like 200 years ago or like, probably yeah. terrible. You probably die when you're like in your 30s. <laughs> well, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. But still, just the experience if it was just for a day or whatever to just see how different the world was and how different people were, but still going to an era where like at least people would still be able to speak the same language and I would still be able to like immerse myself in, in society or whatever. But yeah, yeah. that's yeah. a really cool idea for a movie, man. And I actually, maybe you can speak to this. My dad has a master's in biology, but if his parents had hooked up in 68, it, obviously the, the nurture versus nature shit, like the nurture would have been different because it would have been a different decade and all that. But is there a chance he would have looked the same? What would you say? No. <laughs> it would have been you know, a different <laughs> egg and a different sperm yeah. and a different person. Yeah. Okay. Well, I clearly know nothing about reproduction. Yeah. Well, you got three kids, so you know a little bit. No, but like, okay, so like any single sperm egg combination is going to be a wildly different person, or would he, would he have still looked very similar? That's what I'm wondering. You he know? would look familial. Yeah, you'd look like your uncle or something. Yeah. Or his brother. Yeah. yeah. I clearly don't have a master's in biology. Yeah. Um, and there were... There that's were, still, that's a crazy idea though. Damn. Totally, yeah. And there were four Joyce brothers. Like my dad growing up had four brothers. Mm. But like me growing up, I had... Uh, so there were five brothers. Five altogether, I guess, right? Yeah. Sorry, sorry. Three brothers. Oh, he had There's, three and yeah, he was he had, the fourth. He was okay. the fourth, yeah. And then... And then um, and you I were the only I, child. Yeah, that's an interesting... I have story. a half brother who was born in 74... Oh, uh, I didn't know who this. lives in Lindsay, Ontario. And you're like, you talk to him on, on my dad's side. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Like every now and then we're not super tight, but yeah. Um, yeah. On my dad's <laughs> Imagine side. Imagine he watches this podcast. He's like, thanks, Matt. I thought we were pretty tight. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. He would, he would, he would agree with me. He'd be like, if, if anything, like you should give me a call. Yeah. yeah. And I've been meaning to call him. Yeah. Well, there you go. Yeah. I'm glad we, we, came see, up we see each other every couple of years, but yeah. I didn't know you had uh, a brother. That's yeah. Funny. No, no. I'm, I'm, I'm very, and it's on my dad's side and I'm very much my mom's kid. Mm. Like, like my mom was the artist. She was the writer. She was. I remember like, your mom having a, like I already said, she seemed like a hippie to me. Even when we yeah. were in high school, I remember I told my dad, she was the only person I knew whose parents like who had like white hair but she kept it long i find a lot of women yeah. when they get older and they, their hair goes and they don't want to dye it they get one of the like Karen, mom, yeah she was badass know. she didn't give a fuck she just had this like long but it suited her she like, pulled it off yeah, yeah gandalf the white she was very graceful you know yeah and yeah. she like had it's funny she actually like went through a gandalf the gray <laughs> like transformation to Gandalf the white. Like her hair was actually more gray and the older she got, the more white it got. I love that you made it uh, Lord and, of the Rings. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've never seen those. Any of the Lord of the Rings. Fuck <laughs> off. <laughs> oh I told you this God. when we were uh, at the big rig there, that this if I, amazing. if you, I actually have that poster up there, which Kelly got me. Cause I thought it was a cool idea. It's like a, a scratch lottery thing. Right. So when you watch the movie, you scratch it off. And then you rate yeah. how many stars. Yeah. And I haven't watched the Yo, single. and I swear to God, I'm going to fucking come by with like a homemade advent calendar. Yeah, yeah. Of like, Goodfellas, <laughs> open it up, eat a chocolate. Casino, 
gonna try like just all of them go down yeah, the chocolate that'll Brian be the motivator. De Palma, Scorsese, like all the movie brats all of new hollywood a lot of the comedies I, I have seen that's about it the yeah com comedy was my thing i, I would always rather laugh, oh yeah you know? like the comedy you know the friggin father of the bride three amigos fucking the jerk all the all the Steve Martin classics, I'll leave that. Yeah, I know my dad showed me The Jerk when I was a kid, for sure. I remember that film because it was very weird. It was a funny but very strange, bizarre kind of, it goes this way and that. It's, you know, he's it's the narrative keeps changing direction. I, if I remember it correctly, he's kind of always, you know, uh, it's, it's the next thing to try to fix yeah. the problem. Yeah. And he keeps going from scene to scene and interacting with different characters. And yeah, I, that's any movie. Yes. <laughs> but those, but, those like... Those like mid eighties to mid nineties comedy comedies, like the 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 like what about Bob, you know, yeah. Bill Murray, like yeah, those yeah. were the comedies that like I grew up on. Uncle Buck. That yeah, Uncle Buck, exactly, that my dad was like obsessed with. And you know, like when we were in our twenties, it was like comedy then kind of got like there was like the SNL camp, um, the like wedding crasher camp, and mm. then like the dawn of like the more raunchy like Judd Apatow commercial like Forty Year Old Virgin and, and yeah, but Super I think Forty Year Old and, Virgin you know. um, was a step up from the movies that were popular like five to seven years before, like the American Pies and stuff. Not yeah. to say that there's no place for that film, but like they haven't aged very well. That was like kind of coming out of that raunchy frat boy humor or whatever. But yeah. I feel like the Judd Apatow movies, they had a lot of the same kind of raunchiness, but it had a lot more heart and it wasn't so yeah. just, you know. Yeah, true, true. Oh, yeah. And and even those movies matured because like they were more multifaceted. They were more like slice of life, like American Pie. And I didn't even know this until I studied film theory. Uh, and that gets back to what you were asking me about film criticism at the beginning, um, which I never pursued, but, but because Ottawa had no film production degree, I was forced to take film theory and, and, and I took a course on like seventies and eighties kind of B grade Hollywood. And, and within, uh, the eighties, there was a movie called, or, or a genre, a movement in cinema called the eighties sex quest film. And that, yeah, yeah, Weird. you can, you can Google it. It's interesting. It's, it's a <clears throat> canon of very cheesy B grade movies. They're all teen coming of age, teen comedies. Uh, okay, and okay. they're about young dudes that are trying to lose their virginity. Young, young people trying In to. dorms and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Things. So yeah. like everything that American Pie touches on. Uh, over 10 years later, because American Pie was like 99. Um, that, yeah, that had all been done before tenfold, mm. but in a much less, um, commercial way. Yeah. It wasn't so Hollywood. Like yeah, blockbuster. Was, Cause they were blockbusters. Yeah. American oh, yeah. Pie. Like yeah. they had what, like four, I think there was a bunch of spinoffs totally. too, but there was at least three with like the main cast and they yeah. all did very well. Oh yeah. Like band camp. And like National Lampoons, yeah, I'm pretty sure. And uh, National Lampoons was like they, they would always do know, these um, was Chevy spin Chase off fucking American Pie movies where it'd be yeah. like Stifler's fourth brother. They would just yeah, create exactly. a character. They'd be like Devin Stifler, and he's crazy too. Yeah, I saw a couple of them. They weren't very good. Yeah, no, and even I then mean, they yeah, were like the just, franchise took off. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, actually, now we're talking about film. I, I do not want to forget because I had some questions I was really stoked to ask yeah, yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I think it would be cool if you could tell me what is a movie that makes you laugh hysterically? What is a movie that scares the shit out of you? And what is a movie that uh, makes you cry every time? Mm, interesting. I know it's kind of on the spot. No, but. no. They're very simple questions. They're, I like them. They're very direct. Well, the um, laughing one's probably easiest because I'm sure the there's laughing, many movies. Yeah, the the laughing one. Even on repeated viewings, one that makes you uh, still laugh, you know, you still break up. Oh, well, there's so many. But, like, I would, I would say, like, I always go back to, like, Dumb and Dumber. Oh, yeah. The first I, one. Yeah. I, yeah, I always go back to, like, Oh, pardon me. I always go back to like <laughs> early Jim Carrey, like Ventura. Yeah. Like the fucking guy. Liar, liar. The fucking guy did Ventura, The Mask, and Dumb and Dumber all in the same year. Crazy. 
1994. They were all so huge. Yeah. 94 was a killer. True Lies. Yeah. 94 and 93. Didn't 94 Days and Confused come out too? No, that was 93. 93, 93 was insane. Yeah. 90, I actually like literally I want to do a video where I just talk about American films that came out just in 1993 alone. Whether <laughs> that's it's it, the whether, whole yeah, show. that's it. The entire episode would just be like from the fugitive to in the name of the father to Mrs. Doubtfire. Like it's just, you know, like Yeah, I knew you had a good so knowledge of many, film. There's so That's many incredible me. films that came out in 1993. If I, the if firm, I, um, the firm, that's a Tom Cruise. Never seen it. You've never seen the firm. Oh no, my I'm God. I'm sure my dad has. When people, when people talk about Tom Cruise running, like everybody <laughs> talks about how Tom Cruise can like run yeah. like no one else on camera. It all dates back to the firm. Really? Oh man. That almost makes the me firm, want to see just oh, his yeah. running style. His running in the firm is like, yeah, that's like a, that's like a political thriller. That's, that's yeah. Okay. Edge, edge of your seat suspense. Uh, okay. The second one scared the shit out of me would be, uh, um, which was the one that made you laugh every dumb time. And dumber. Oh, dumb and dumber. Yes. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Uh, scared the shit out of me would, when I was a kid, it would be the exorcist. I feel like that's and everybody. Yeah. Yeah. That's everybody. As an adult, it would be under the skin. Never heard of this, which is a, independent film from the uk i think it's a co-production between the states and scottish and it's scottish oh yeah. you've seen it yeah i haven't seen it. i have it to watch because oh. it's uh what's your face black widow there yeah yeah oh uh, it's scarlett, uh, scarlett, scarlett johansson, johansson. Yeah. Oh, interesting john jonathan glazer jonathan glazer i think this is not on my radar yeah. at all but 2014 it's a kind of neo-noir film about a prostitute who's an alien who basically just like abducts. Oh, I remember seeing trailers for this. Abducts lonely men and, eats and them kills or them. Or kills them. Yeah, yeah. and it huh. it literally scared the living bejesus out of me. It's it's a beautiful film. Like yeah. it it like existentially it it arises because her character goes through such a transformation and it's and it's 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 absolutely insane um in but it's legitimately of, scary yeah it really makes you think about humanity and like what it means to be a human being and to love someone and intimacy and 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 all that but like in the first like two acts first act to like act to be like like that that like first 75 percent of the movie literally just like dis it just disturbed the living bejesus out of me wow uh, so no dates for a while after that no eh? dates for a while actually no i luckily was in a relationship when i saw it i was actually like just about to move to australia with my ex when i saw it um but yeah when 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 i saw it i saw it alone this reminds me, actually, um, I, didn't, I haven't seen the movie, but what you're describing, the alien woman who seduces men and kills them. There's a movie I watched on DVD back in the day. It was like early 2000s, and it was shot in Ottawa. And that was basically the plot of the movie. It was like these hot chicks that showed up, and then when they go to fuck the guy, they like open their shirt, and there's like all these weird tentacle things coming <laughs> out, and then it goes into them. Yeah. I, th I think. I, I saw this so long yeah. ago. What the fuck was that called? It's like imposters or something like that. It's not the name of it, but it's something like that. Someone who's like um, deceiving you and, and posing as someone else. Yeah, What's yeah, the yeah. Fucking name yeah. Of the movie? Bedazzled. Like, Remember Bedazzled? That was um, Elizabeth Earl. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's kind of like, and there's like, there's the Vembot, Vempots with. Vembot? Vem, vem, Vempots with Austin with Powers. Austin Powers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're yeah, saying the yeah. women that kill the men. Yeah, while yeah, yeah. Being... But, but like, that could be my movie that made me laugh the most. Like, that's like so on the opposite mm. you know but yeah what's the um, one that makes you cry every time uh or do you ever fuck. cry at films i guess some people aren't phased by movies like that no but. no god no 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 if anything this would be the hardest because there's the most of them like i, I <laughs> cried i cried he's like most. it's the hardest because i don't want to think about it and start crying right now yeah no. yeah like it's endless, like whether it be Shawshank or uh, Searching for Bobby Fischer. I mm. love that movie, the chess movie with the little kid. Um, 
I'd probably have to say Dead Poet Society makes me cry okay. a lot. That and again, this is getting back to like Mr. Parsons. The this, teacher that this, really yeah, connects. This this is this is literally getting back to the idea of the kid, the student that thinks that because it's a boys' school, mm. that thinks he's not enough. And the like tyrant uh, dean, you know, administration, uh, administration yeah. head, you know, and then the kind of like rogue teacher who's like super liberal and like doesn't come from that disciplined academic and really background. wants to connect with the kids. He, exactly. Yeah. And he comes into the school system, shakes everything up, sees these like potential and in the boys and like I'll spoil it. Cause fuck if, if, old, the, yeah. if, if the viewers haven't seen it came out in 1989, if you haven't seen it, I haven't like, seen it. Oh my God. I know what it is. Yeah. yeah, yeah I'm yeah. very aware of film. Like I'll know who's in the movie, but I just, yeah, I don't watch a lot of TV or movies at all. Honestly, yeah. God, like, yeah, I'm, I'm yeah. watching the boys right now and a couple other shows maybe, but like, mm -hmm. I don't, yeah. Yeah. Don't well, like the lead in it ends up committing suicide because he wants to be an actor and his dad won't let him. And he mm. like kills it at this performance. Like he does such a good job. And like Robin Williams plays the teacher. I knew that much. Yeah, yeah. Mr. Mr. Keating. And like he's there. And I've seen a scene where he stands up on the table. Yeah, and, and yeah, exactly. An and then the and then it's like Mr. Keating, like Williams' character, is like blamed for the boy committing suicide. Oh, brutal. Like the dean like flips it to like scapegoat. And this is all the things that like, like churn my inside so much, like, you know, social justice and like, yeah. just, you know, um, dishonesty and everything. And, and the right so, versus wrong. Exactly. Yeah. It's, yeah. Just like, like fundamental, value, exactly. Yeah. Fundamental, like morals yeah. and ethics Virtues, and values yeah. and everything. And, and, and at the end, um, you know, the, the famous scene, like, Oh, captain, my captain, like yeah. the boys all sit on the desk and everything. And like, I remember like watching it as a kid with my mom and like, they all fucking stand up on the desk and my mom was just like shouting at the TV, like you stand up, you stand up. <laughs> and, and, and I'm right there. Like I'm bawling. And, and, and to this, to this day, that scene between like student and teacher and, and like that bonding, that bonding yeah. of like, I believe in you. Like, well, cause this is something you struggled with on your own. Yeah, yeah. Education. Very the, relatable. The, yeah. the, exactly. And this, this is 100% what it's all about. And again, like, could I ever have that deep inherent, like emotional identification with a TikTok video? Fuck no. Yeah. You know what I mean? Well said. It's like, yeah. it's like, I want to see protagonists. Character building. On, yeah. World building. Exactly. Yeah. Like characters and protagonists on screen that relate, that, that I see my own life and my own struggles and trials yeah. and tribulations and everything in them. And, and to go back to Graham, like, those are my three, but my favorite movie on the planet, always been the same, American Beauty. Okay, you told me this, yeah, actually. American, we Prince, yeah, exactly. American Beauty has always been my favorite movie. And Graham and I saw it in 1999 when we were 14 at Saint Laurent. And I Sucks about Kevin Spacey, though. Sucks about Kevin Spacey, but honestly, like, don't even edit this out of no, the, no. Like, I mean, like, whatever. I, the film no, is still a good film for sure. I'll, I'll go one further to say that, like, Woody Allen, mm. Michael Jackson, Kevin Spacey. I, I don't agree with the whatever it is if they're guilty, and I'm sure in Kevin Spacey, you know, yeah, there's he's enough, there is enough <laughs> evidence there, but like. I you can separate that exactly, from the from the exactly art. Mm. exactly do I do I condone it fuck no it's terrible yeah but I separate the talent the cast member yeah. from the character 
Just like when I'm working on a film set as an assistant director, I will see like, you know, call sheet, talent, I guess the argu- name, character name. Like they're two. I just look at them differently. No, I get what you're saying. I think the yeah. argument that some people would make would that be uh, if you support those artists in any way, like buying a ticket to their film, yeah. then you are kind of, you yeah. know, an enabler to their shitty behavior. Or whatever. 100%. But I yeah. get what you're saying as well, especially a, for a film that's like. 20 years old or whatever it is, you know, um, mm-hmm. more than that now, I suppose. Um, I, I would be able to do the same. I'm saying I could watch American exactly. Beauty and be like, all right, whatever. Yeah. Um, it's I don't think he should be getting thing. cast in new roles. <laughs> I think he should be no. stay, you know, no. shut the fuck up for the yeah. rest of your life and, you know, probably be in jail yeah. by the sounds of it if they can prove a lot of this stuff. So, yeah. you know, he should get his comeuppance, but like you, you know, like that's the character. I, I can get past that. I for... can't, I can't go back and change the impact that Lester Burnham's character had on my life. In the fact that, that you in... just dropped his full name clearly. That's, that's yeah. Like, I didn't even remember his first name. So. Yeah. Yeah. That's, you know what I mean? Or like, or like Alvy Singer and like Annie Hall, like Woody mm. Allen's, you know, it doesn't matter. Like any of these protagonists, that these actors or actor directors play, you know, like I can remember. And again, this is like fierce nostalgia, but like, I can remember what I was wearing. I can remember like the month. It's I can't, like burned like, into your it's mind. It's burned into yeah. my memory. Like Graham, Graham and I walked home like for the longest time trying to find a bus stop to like take the Saint Laurent bus back to Beacon Hill and we is that just, so we weird? Just, There's like days you don't remember anything from. Yeah, and then that one moment, exactly. you've got like all these minute yeah. details that really aren't, you know, going to serve you yeah. other than just reminiscing. But it's totally. great. It's it's weird how the brain works, though, man. I was wearing these Oakley glasses that were the same ones as like Wesley Snipes in Blade, <laughs> like the fives. I don't even know why I was wearing glasses. We got out of the movie theater. It was like midnight. And it was like, it was like January, my hair was dyed blonde, you know, like I kind of looked like Eminem and like Slim Shady LP, you know. I'm sure you weren't the only one at that time. Yeah. Like this was 23 years ago. And, and, and like, we just were walking through a snowstorm talking about like how that movie basically like blew our brains apart like from an existential standpoint we were just mm. like like the bag the 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 kind of like bag blowing in the wind and like you know looking at just how you look at everything in life and how you choose to look at it yeah. and noticing beauty in everything and it like, also hasn't you know, aged well, though, in the fact that, like, not only is Kevin Spacey in Hot Water for all that, but in that movie, his character is attracted to his yeah. daughter's underage friend. Like, oh, it's for sure. really not for aged sure. well in that regard. Oh, I know. And with I the know. real life stuff mixing in. But, but yeah, there, it's still a crazy, crazy movie, like how, you know, obviously he gets shot by the neighbor and all that at the end. And I remember it, it being very captivating. I haven't seen it in years, but I guess. It's, it's like the thing it's unapologetic mm. and it doesn't hide like yeah. it's so it's hum- raw exactly yeah, yeah. like you know like i swear to god all those people in the world that can be like mer, 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 kevin spacey i swear to god so many of us are guilty of something yeah like that Various that degrees. that movie with its impulses and curiosity and like voyeuristic lens Mm. like like it's just touching upon something in such a subtle way like so much of western society is like looking at ourselves in the mirror with a pot belly and grabbing 10 pound weights saying (laughs) i'm gonna fucking make a change (laughs) in my life and you know quitting our job and like buying the dream car. He starts smoking weed. It I was starts smoking <laughs> weed. Like it's it's just like it's 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 that urge mm. to follow that like childlike impulse. Yeah. To to get out of that that rut and that yeah. rat race where you feel trapped. Like and and the first few minutes of the film, they hit on it. Like you can just see. Day one, like, hi, like for you, Brad, yeah, I've got five. Up like, here. Yeah, yeah, like yeah. it's, it's, he's, I do remember that when he was in, weightlifting thinking like, 
this this feeling of like palpable like relaxation mm-hmm. of him being free of his like yeah. bullshit and yeah. him just being yes. and his wife's like aren't you gonna man and he's just like yeah. whatever exactly <laughs> like, give exactly yeah. lester you will not get away with this like that's what you think <laughs> like like it's like it's yeah oh my god oh, i could man. fucking go on and on but like that movie that movie was the first moment where I was like, film is not entertainment. Mm. Like it is, but there's so much more. There's that. And, and I think mm. this, this is what just makes me feel sad is that like outside of film school, like when I studied film theory, there haven't been, there hasn't been a lot of moments in my life where I've found, um, cause the peer group that I have in Toronto we're awesome. We're like fucking great friends and we make films together, but it's funny. Like we're all like, we're all like the magnificent seven. Like we all, all of my friends, like we're all known for different things Mm. and we have different, none of us agree on the same thing. We all like different movies. I have very few friends in Toronto that like the same types of movies that I do. Well, that's good being you know? exposed to all yeah. those different viewpoints. Yeah, totally. But like, it's just like there, there isn't, it's like, there's like the Marvel superhero blockbuster. There's like, so like, m- like middle of the road movies have been abolished in terms of like theatrical release. It's like independent it's, it's kind of like the economy. It's like that 1%. There's yeah. either like the really, really, really big budget. Something Disney. Yeah, yeah, exactly. There's the fucking 100 to $200 million movies. Or some offshoot, like and then super there's, gorilla film. Yeah. yeah, and then there's the like Moonlight movies. That yeah, yeah. Like win. that's a, the perfect yeah, example. Yeah, because yeah. Moonlight, like La La Land was made for $30 million, Yeah. And that's rare to even see a movie that's made that like 20. Yeah. yeah, That like a movie of that scale for even that to be made for 30, like that budget point is more reminiscent of something that you would see in the nineties, you know, like now it would be like, it'd be kind of like more all or nothing. So when you say those middle, middle of the road movies, I'm thinking like to go back to the nineties, like, a movie like Three Ninjas or something like that, yeah. where it's like it's yeah. not fucking huge blockbuster, but it's also not some guy in his camcorder or whatever. You yeah, know? exactly. The like ten to thirty. It's like this will sell some tickets. Yeah, it's not gonna break you know records, but totally. it's gonna be bankable. Yeah, it will. Gen- genre at the end of the day takes precedent over that because mm. you can still find ten to thirty million dollar movies made all the time, but like. Are they, are they breaking through? Are they the like Kramer versus Kramers? Like, yeah. are, they, are they the like all those like raw dramas of the 70s that were like all about character? Mm. Whether it's like looking for Mr. Goodbar or Taxi Driver or whatever, Marathon Man, like all of those movies, those, and these aren't my words. Like, so many, so many film theorists have said this. Like, those movies would not be made the like United artists era of, of cinema in the seventies in the, in North America, that shit would not be made nowadays. So now it's like the really, really, really small stuff, the indie stuff, the moonlights, which go on to win best picture, which yeah. is amazing. But not that you often. Know? I mean, not that, that often, a, Yeah, but there's that. Or you've got the Fast and the Furious. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So like you're kind of. I don't want to just keep throwing Marvel under the bus. I mean, I'm wearing no, a Wolverine shirt. No, 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 no. this room. Yeah, totally. And, <laughs> and, and you know what? There's a place for it. And MCU is a mixed bag for me. I don't love every Marvel movie, but I do mm-hmm. think that uh, uh, people shouldn't overlook them completely and be like, well, because of the genre, it's got to be stupid. It's like, well, you can still have good storytelling. If you, you have to be obviously willing to go along with that. But how is that any different from Lord of the Rings and fucking orcs and shit? You yeah. know, like it's your, your disbelief has to be there or suspending your belief totally for, for the surreal and the fantasy and, and all that, you know, yeah. so you're either into that or you're not. But if someone's like, Oh, Lord of the Rings was such an amazing film, but Captain America and the winter soldier was 
trashy blockbuster. It's like, well, it's actually a really good film. It was a really uh, kind of like a spy thriller, that one. Yeah, you know? I mean, I used to hate. Some of them are terrible. I used to hate a lot more than I do now. My buddy brought me to Civil War when I first Civil War was good. When I first moved to Toronto. But those are heavy. Those are movies that, like, if someone who wasn't in the MCU, and I've talked about this before, went to a movie like Civil War, I would not hold it against them if they're like, why is there fucking two teams of all super people and I don't know who any of them are? Because that was a movie where you really had to kind of already have immersed yourself in the Marvel Cinematic Universe and all that. Yeah. But there are some really great standalones, like The Winter Soldier, where you could kind of bring someone who doesn't really know shit all. I guess it's the solo films that focus on one character more because you can kind of just... You know, there's maybe a comment you might not get here or there, but largely you can enjoy it still. But mm-hmm. yeah, like Endgame or one of these movies where it's like there's fucking 60 characters and they're all from 20 different films that you're supposed to have seen. And yeah. now there's shows on Disney Plus that you're also supposed to tie in and like for sure. Unreal. Yeah. Luckily- and and I can't hate on you because because honestly, like that. I don't want to call it your world, but for the sake of this discussion, it's not let's, just me, obviously. Let's, no, hundred percent. But for the sake of this podcast, let's call it your world, and then we'll flip it back on me. I am guilty. I haven't even seen Iron Man from uh, two thousand eight, the, the yeah, original. The yeah, original. Yeah. I think so you like, told me this. That's yeah. I think I said yeah. So so that is how few. I think I've seen the first Avengers movie, mm. and I've seen Civil War. And th- there, there's a funny Thor, four, Thor, Thor, Ra- number three, yeah, yeah. Regal Ro- See, I didn't care. Well, it was okay. the New Ragnarok. Zealand, yeah, 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 yeah. The New, Z- yeah. I saw that, but that's that's it. It was okay it. to that's me. That one was I've too seen. funny. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Anyways, well, um, I did want to ask you about Tarantino because I know you're a big Tarantino fan. Since we're on film, I wanted to know what it was. About- I was in high school. I wouldn't say if I. Oh, you're not now. I wouldn't okay. Say, Interesting. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say I'm that big of a fan now. Because I was going to ask if you saw Once Upon a Time in Hollywood and what you thought. Oh about. yeah, I and thought I it was loved, fantastic. And I loved, I loved it. I, I love that. I, I mean, that's new Hollywood. That is 1969. That like when I first heard that he was covering that era mm. in Hollywood history. And the Manson murders and all the that. Manson yeah, yeah. The Manson murders, the fucking Sharon Roman Polanski, Sharon and, yeah. Tate, Roman Polanski, all the the moment like I Bruce Lee too. Bruce Lee, yeah, which was that, a little weird. That, that was <laughs> they made that him was, seem like yeah, a putz. <laughs> yeah, that was you know I I do like that line though where like uh, Brad Pitt the chick comes back like who already hates him. And she's like, what the hell's going on here? He's like, I just threw that little fucker into the car over there. <laughs> Something really casual. <laughs> but yeah, I didn't yeah. think they did Bruce Lee really justice there at all. Because obviously he would have kicked the shit out of him. I yeah, mean, for sure. Anyone who's seen Bruce oh, Lee, yeah, was a fucking beast. In 69, like Fists of Fury. It was he, still funny. For he was that. like at his prime. Um, that was four years before his death. You know, he was like. That film, though, uh, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, it was very crazy in the twist ending again i don't want to spoil it i guess i guess probably most people have seen it at this point have you watched it then yeah the the twist being that like you know they lead you or he leads you to believe that it's going to be you're going to witness the manson murders and then Mm -hmm. it's like this is it an alternate reality where like yeah or is that just going to happen in a couple nights they don't really explain it it kind of ends on that and I, his whole acid trip where he's like beating the shit out of the intruders it was fucking very unexpected i like absolutely love the like motif of like the successful a-list hollywood and everything that that represents is like contained in like the house next door Mm. and leo like wants to be a part of that because he's kind of washed up now and he's kind of washed up and everything that leads up to that. And yeah, the whole friggin' storyline. That scene with the that, little girl, man, when he's realizing that the book he's reading yeah. is basically about what he's going through. That was, that's a tearjerker scene, man. Yeah. Yeah. So oh I actually God. wanted to say this because uh, I know I'm cutting off the, the question here, but I, I thought of when we were talking about movies that make us cry, one that always makes me cry is Powder. Have you seen Powder? Yeah. It's a great film, I think. Yeah, and Jeff I Goldblum and uh but there's I there's a lot of dad son and... drama in that and that yeah. I think was always what made me cry. Not that we have a bad relationship, but I I think that's something that a lot of men it'll get you. If yeah. you see like father son stuff. For it sure. just does. I don't know For why. Sure. Cuz yeah. men butt heads and, and stuff like that and it was uh, Yeah. 
Uh, Taren, really, uh, De Niro and his kid in a Bronx Tale. Never seen. I don't. You ever seen that? No, I know. It's I've like, heard of it as well. It's like De Niro's directorial debut. I mm. think he made it in like '93. But there's this poignant moment where like De Niro's a bus driver. He plays a bus driver, and he like gets down low and he's talking to his kid, and he's like talking about wasted talent. And he's like, son, you can you can have all the talent in the world, but if you don't do anything with it, is this whole rant about wasted mm. talent. And it's like so profound, like everything that he says. And I remember seeing that like really young and just being like, Holy shit. But yeah, there's yeah, there's 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 father son for sure. For sure, um, for sure. And now I'm going back actually, but speaking of Tarantino, um, there's a bunch of things I don't want to forget. Uh, I we were speaking of Kevin Spacey and the whole like separating from the art and, and the person, right? And I yeah. feel like I almost have to like do that with Tarantino. Suspects. Uh yeah, exactly. <laughs> T- Tarantino though seems like someone where I almost feel like I have to separate him because I do enjoy his movies for the most part, but when I see him in interviews and stuff, he seems kind of weird, kind of unhinged a little bit. Mm-hmm. And uh and the foot fetish thing I find just kind of weird that it's so obvious. I don't know yeah. if you've you're aware of that. I, yeah, I, 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 yeah, I mean, I, I've seen like, it's just weird. It's I've so seen prominent. like the Renaissance painting meme where like Tarantino's like reaching out to touch, like, what is it like the star of David or whatever? And he's just like reaching out. And on the other side, it's just a foot. Oh, <laughs> have I didn't, seen that? I have, no, yeah. I haven't, but that's hilarious. Yeah. yeah because um, uh, someone had told me about it. And then when I watched that newest, uh, once upon a time in Hollywood, there was just, Moments where you're like, okay, yeah, that's an unnecessary close up of Margot Robbie's feet. Oh, yeah. again. Oh, another scene. They're doing it again. You're like, <laughs> I mean, I kind of write it off. I like write it off as just like it being weird filmmaker, like auteur. I hate to use that term, but just like um, self indulgent. Yeah, yeah, exactly. He's like, everyone knows I like this. I yeah. could probably get away with it. Yeah. And, and, That's and weird. they're recycling those tendencies. And, and I just think that that is a real thing, uh, yeah. in, 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 in filmmaker for, for directors. And, and I, yeah, I, I get, I think I, I, maybe I like understand the root impulse of that tendency. Okay. And then I just kind of like, as a director, you'll give him a pass. Yeah. Yeah. Or just like, you know, as, as, as someone who's, who's, you know, studied film, I'm just kind of like, all right, I, I get where he or she is coming from. It's almost like, like a Freudian slip that he's like putting in the movie. I mean, it, to me, it's just weird that it's public knowledge and he still continues to do it. Yeah. If it was something people were noticing, but now like, it's like, dude, there's articles about this and stuff like that. And then you're going to make another movie. Have we talked about this on the podcast before? No, eh? maybe it was just at your place, but I thought that must be so weird for like that scene with Margot Robbie. It's like, everyone knows everyone in the room filming knows with mm-hmm. the camera zoomed in on her feet and yeah. no one's going to say anything. And he's like, yeah, yeah just uh, wiggle your big pinky or <laughs> wiggle your little piggy. Like it, how yeah. do you direct that scene without yeah. everyone going like, yo, this is fucking weird. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, like it's funny from from a auteur theory standpoint, I find it fascinating because the auteur theory basically states that there's certain, excuse me, <laughs> there are certain um, subject matter, themes, images um, that one is consumed by like they they just and draw and, you in and stuff. yeah and and just like Woody Allen Woody Allen's a perfect example all of his obsession with like death and and like what is the meaning of life and what does it all mean and why am I here and mm. and that constant kind of like Sisyphus like you know like why even bother like almost borderline nihilism and everything like Ooh, all of it's the point no know, that was a terrible Woody Allen <laughs> can you do a Woody Allen all of that <laughs> not really all, all of that uh, <laughs> so bad. all of that subject matter is like constantly just recycled in his films again and again and again and maybe with Tarantino it's more like visual you know, 
uh, or little quirks that aren't so literal, but I love the root of where that theory comes from. You're just fascinated by the process. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and I mean, like, like Jean, again, Jean Renoir had this line. He's like, a filmmaker only makes one film. And then he or she breaks it into little pieces and makes it again. Oh, interesting. So you dissect and I your love, first thing. I love the idea that we're on this earth and we're like kind of obsessed with like this one idea this or like one kind of like canon of ideas that we're wrestling with and we're never you know it's it's always that pursuit for perfection that pursuit for like the mona lisa masterpiece where we finally arrive and we've said everything that we want to yeah, say I've done it. as our exactly yeah. but it never, never happens. it never no. happens so it's constantly recycling it again and again and again and and yeah so like i'm the guy in the theater where like if I see another low angle tracking shot of Tarantino with feet, I just smile and be like, that's my boy. <laughs> like, I love it. I, I absolutely love it. Like Cinephile. when, when, yeah, when, 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 the, when filmmakers constantly repeat themselves, mm. it's like a signature. Yeah. Almost. It yeah. doesn't bother me at all. I, I had to, I had to like write numerous papers on the O theory and and a lot of people think that like film theory in general is like uh pretentious and you know kind of me 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 but like yeah. you know i well I, no you've you've said you know, a lot of interesting shit today like a, a lot of the people you've quoted really cool interesting stuff in my opinion i mean i don't you. know a lot about film clearly all these fucking films i've never seen that are super famous <laughs> oh uh, and that's that's just like hollywood of the last 30 years like that's just the tip of the iceberg yeah if you're ever fascinated your listeners are ever fascinated um the story of film by mark cousins his voice is insanely annoying in terms of like <laughs> listening to this is like, like an audiobook or yeah something? in terms of like voiceover narration uh for like hours upon hours it can get a bit like can oh you give me God. an example of his voice like a sampling of how does he uh, sound he, he, nasally or nasally just i can't really I, I can't really do it yeah kind of kind of um and then in the twenties we had this. <laughs> I don't even that, know this guy, but that's that funny. Dawned upon a new era of cinema. Oh. Like, like it's 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 very it's 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 pretty it's pretty un it gets under your skin to like to listen to his voice, but like but it's he, great. he has such a vast documentary series called The Story of Film. Uh and he has a new uh, installment called the new generation, which is exploring everything I was trying to touch on about like, where are we going with digital video? Like yeah. what this oversaturation? Yeah, yeah. And, and just like everything with film, like the, the, the line between, and I'm, I would hate to have to study this now as an academic, like there's so many students that are going to be studying the line between like uh, the photographic image, the representation of the thing versus the real life, yeah. you know, and how that like, it's like people going to concerts and then they're just like yeah. watching the concert through their phone yeah. as opposed to. There was such a eyes. distance in, in previous decades of like real life versus the representation of the thing. Yeah. And now it's just well, like, the lines are so blurred. Yeah. 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 Like so much of my, you know, awake alert, so-called consciousness is like, yeah. damaging my neck <laughs> muscles looking down at this dude thing. i'm actually having the same issue and sometimes, yeah. you know and then like soaking up like representations i never even use that word representation i'm thinking i'm like oh apple's telling me that this is a memory from like last week or a month ago or mm. whatever and i just have all these videos and stills of like my life and and 
I I think as an artist, the ability to just put that rapid device that is so synonymous with immediacy yeah. that we can capture this moment right here, right now. Yeah. Just like that impulse where you like get the urge and then Google something immediately. Yeah. It's like, no, silence that. Go, okay. go home, journal about it. Yeah. Try and really like, like again, getting, not everybody's going to do this. I mean, I advise everybody to write in their journal, but like as artists, it's like get to that deeper root. What are you actually trying to say? And then, and just like put in the time, just like a sculptor and you keep, it's malleable. It's pliable. It's like, yeah. it doesn't just happen by you staring at the wall. It happens by you like, right. Yeah. Like Enacting. we don't, we can't, if, if there's so many amazing cultural theorists that have talked about, like, you know, if, if you just wait for inspiration, like a bolt of lightning to hit you in the head, you're not going to get a lot of work done. Yeah. And Lord knows, you know, um, analysis paralysis, like overthinking, yeah. like I've been so guilty of that. Where like do try, I start? where do I start? What is this per perfect idea? But like my advice to anybody is like, you know, like, um, the artist way, Julia Cameron or whatever her name is like the artist, <laughs> the artist way is an amazing book, uh, or Natalie, Natalie Goldberg, um, writing down the bones. That's another amazing book. Like there's books that teach you how to write that teach you, that felt experience that you need to like get the ball rolling. And it's really about free rights. It's really about what they call morning pages where you just wake up and it's just like a brain dump of everything, all your thoughts and feelings, everything that's going on in your life. And it sounds kind of like, Oh, like what is this going to change? You know, but like literally you like the ideas come to you while the gears are already in motion. Mm. They don't come to you when you're at a standstill. Yeah. That's the one thing. You got to get the learned. engine running. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Like it's, it's that's good advice for yeah. sure. Yeah. 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 Just I mean, start. Yeah. Yeah. Start before you're Honestly, ready. I find even like when I'm feeling one of those days where I don't know where to begin or whatever, Something that is very simple, but very useful to me is just writing a list of like, these are the things I want to get done. And then that feeling of scratching them off one by one. And then at the end of the day, you're like, I did all the shit. I did all mm -hmm. the things because it was there like a little task list. And I don't know. That's what I need a lot of the time to stay organized and focused. And, but yeah, totally. I, the smartphone is really and social media and all that is the one vortex that you can just burn so much valuable time that you could be doing shit or making oh. shit. And it's, it's, it's not even our fault. It's like engineered that way to literally manipulate us. You know, yeah. I mean, everyone's personal willpower is obviously going to come into play, but we're all at a disadvantage to start with if we're on these devices because they're yeah. meant to kind of distract us constantly. That's, that's literally what they're for. They want totally. our attention. You totally. Know? And, and like, depending on your temperament and your brain chemistry, you will either excel at it um excel at what like being on so social you'll, media yeah you'll yeah, kill yeah. it like it's it's like spider-man shit like with great power comes great responsibility like that's that's a marvel quote <laughs> um you have great power in your hands true true and your brain can either make the most of it or recoil <laughs> dominate social media or social media can absolutely you. buckle you yeah. into an anxious, you know, ball of, of misery where you're just kind of like, I'm scrolling and I'm watching everybody else's highlight reel. Oh, see and what I'm, I was going to say, my know, personal issue is, I mean, I, I'm sure that happens for a lot of people and I, I'm sure I have moments of that where I'm comparing myself to whatever. Yeah. I'm not super guilty of that. I am guilty of just catching myself being like, like, what the fuck am I doing? Yeah. Just aimlessly scrolling 100%. and being like, wait, I already saw this post. I'm at the point where I'm seeing repeat posts on Facebook. Yeah. Maybe I should put the fucking phone down. Actually, you know? that's a good thing. I did that recently. I unfollowed like 900 people mm. to the point where like I only had 
I was only following like 400 people. Yeah. And then I started noticing as I was scrolling, I was seeing the same posts again. Yeah. And then you're like, fuck this. And then when yeah. I saw the same posts again, I was like, oh, fuck. Well, I guess I've seen everything. It's like a slap in put, the face. Like, hey, yeah, what the yeah. fuck are you doing? Yeah. And then I thought about it a few weeks later. I was like, oh, my God. It's probably because I unfollowed all those people. Yeah. They like, don't have any more content to show you. Yeah. You've, you've seen yeah. it all. It's and so I was true. Like, and I was like, you know what? I'm fucking glad I did that. Yeah. That's good I advice. I should unfollow more people like you know you know those people that have like three million followers and then like following well and some people zero, post constantly you know. too so certain people you yeah. follow and then they've got like 16 posts a day and you're like okay it's, yeah. i liked you but i don't need that much of you in my fucking shit. yeah yeah i mean just just man honestly like fuck like people who have adhd and anxiety shouldn't they literally should have like a stopwatch like if, if your temperament doesn't align with social media, if you're easily anxious and overwhelmed and all that, and your medium or art form or vocation or whatever somewhat demands that you need to use. Interact with that. Yeah. Like I have to use social media to a certain point. I don't. Like I do... You're not super active on that. God, yeah, yeah. no. If it's 100% spectrum for filmmakers, I'm at like 5 to 10%. Yeah. And I just, I should care, but I don't. That's awesome. Um, more people need to, I think. Yeah. But I mean, mindset. I mean, the more entrepreneurial I get, the more I will have to care. Yeah. But as long as you're you measured know. and how much you use it and use it just when you need to and you yeah. don't get sucked into that rabbit like, hole. Like crew members and people who work on other people's productions, people who like work in the industry doing various, you know, roles in various departments, they're off working on big productions where they have to sign NDAs to not post anything. Yeah. I've worked on jobs where like, if you friggin' post anything about the movie that you're working on, you're fired and you're blacklisted from the union. Shit. So you kind of like get it in your mind that, you know, and then like that you can't post. And then you go on like some small commercial production and they're like, Oh, by the way, like post every five minutes. Yeah. Like we want you to post about the exact it's opposite. Total, it's the exact yeah. opposite. And for most indie film, it's that it's promote Instagram Tell stories, yeah. new post, like, yeah. you know, click on the story brings you to the new post, all that shit. Yeah. But like, if you're easily distracted and overwhelmed and like you have difficulty prioritizing what is important, yeah. it's like you almost want to just go on Fiverr and outsource that some, that, that little thing, that, that task, little, yeah. that like social media marketing management, you know, analytics, whatever to like someone else, get them to do it so that you can excel at, at what it is that you do because stop it's, wasting time. With, it's yeah. very, very easy to like look and compare and and like self-destructive yeah just well isn't from it a, weird too that like it's anxiety promoting for sure we have uh limitations for age on on like alcohol and and every other substance mind-altering substance and yet social media you can basically have a facebook account when you're like 10 or something as long as your mom says it's okay or whatever or yeah. tiktok or all these things and it's proven to be like these massive dopamine uh, you know, conduits to our brain of just like overstimulation, not good for you in, in largely the same way that a lot of drugs, I, I saw, I heard some comparison to cocaine. I'm not going to even try and quote it cause I'm sure I'll get it wrong, but you know, it's clearly not healthy. And yet we, we don't really have much regulation yeah. when it comes to smartphones, social media, et cetera, not only for kids, but even like, like you were saying, people with certain uh, mental issues or, or, you know, mental health stuff or just the wrong type of person. It doesn't really work for some yeah. people and it can be really, really detrimental yeah. to their life. And yeah, I, I think we rolled out a lot of this shit too fast without enough foresight and a lot of companies that just wanted to make money and probably they didn't even really know how it was going to go either. Like you think fucking, um, what's his name? Fucking Facebook guy. He talks like an alien 
Mark Zuckerberg. Yeah. <laughs> he, he very much looks like an alien all the time. I find For he's sure. like humaning yeah. his best. His um, eyes, but do you think he knew huge. like what fucking Facebook was really going to become? Fuck no. no. He wanted to make money. He was like, oh, this seems people seem to like this. But no yeah. one knew what it was going to become. And no one would have ever envisioned. I don't think that it yeah. was going to be so huge and, and not just facebook obviously but all these platforms that are similar and for sure media yeah in general like, and like meta meta is like, the new meta is the company VR, that like like, owns no but like what is it there's like they just M- changed the name of facebook to meta right yeah yeah there's like i don't know why a though. tech group that like is now branded on facebook that like owns instagram <sighs> and owns like all of them now i think i, I don't know facebook owns instagram i think Yes, Facebook yeah. owns yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. He just made he just and... made Meta the same way Google made Alphabet, right? It's a mm. heard of that. Alphabet's sort of like the overarching company, I think. That Google oh, and all okay, these other okay. things. Same thing with Meta now. So all these other Instagram, it's the umbrella and, yeah, for yeah, yeah, and, and and it's to look at the future, right? Meta Metaverse is where he's going. So, well, uh, that's it's supposed to be like a VR thing in the long run, right? It's going to be this like, oh, yeah, world that it's all immersive and. Yeah, well, he bought Oculus, right? Yeah. So he's got the Oculus headset. But now. going on your Facebook um, feed in the future is going to be like virtual reality. Like, yeah, it's totally where it's Photos going are going by, or, yeah. you know, I don't know. I, I virtual don't know. reality, oh, augmented reality. They're yeah. all playing in it, like Google, yeah, Microsoft, uh, Apple. Did you so. hear? I just read a thing about a guy um, who was at Google or something like that, and he left uh, on his own accord because he said that an AI had developed sentience and they've sort of disproved his claims, but there's some creepy shit. Well, I, I actually read the article that so he wrote, I. that he wrote. Yeah. And, or parts and, of it at least. Yeah. I read a lot of it and including his actual dialogue with, yeah. with the AI. And it was right? creepy. Yeah. It was like saying the, like, it's really come a long way. And, and the people who were disproving it, they, they haven't been, into it as much as he is exactly and, and there's there's a particular way of interacting with the program that seems to elicit a very much more human-like response than these other people who aren't as nuanced in how they're interrogating the, mm. the program so but the the degree of complexity in the answers that sometimes come out of there, i'm going holy fuck like, well it was saying <laughs> that it wanted to be regarded as an employee and not as property because mm. it felt like it had sentience i guess well, like it a, talks about being sad it talks about you yeah know, you know things like this and it's crazy so shit. so is it just yeah. wall dressing or is it actually stuff yeah so is it's it just, just super smart computing processing that's mimicking in such an uncanny uh degree you know but the thing is it's getting better and better at that as time goes by so at what point if you can't tell if it's does it even matter then, yeah. yeah that's right then and you're you're dealing with the real deal maybe at that point i don't that's know so fucked. and does the con- does the com- the company's Skynet. very leery right they're <laughs> they're afraid of too much of this getting out there anyway yeah, yeah it's a very interesting shit. thing um okay well we probably yeah. should wrap it it's yeah. 11 um yeah, i'll sure. ask you the question i've been asking everybody this season yeah. which is uh if you weren't doing what you currently do for a career, uh, what would be sort of like your dream job? I, I feel like we sort of touched on that. Mm. So if, if it's easier, then you can also answer this alternatively or both. Um, what did you want to be when you were growing up as a kid? Wow. I mean, growing up uh, as a kid, I wanted to be like an actor, writer, director. Oh, that young, eh? Yeah, pretty much. I, I mean, I met be... you in a theater group in grade eight. Yeah, so I, fair, I yeah. wanted to be more of an actor, I think. But I'm still, like, casting myself in short films and stuff. Um, So, no, I mean, I I think I'm one of those people that in a very naive, foolish kind of way uh, pursued and is still... You followed your dreams. ...trucking along. Yeah. Like, I am not... Uh, from an external validation standpoint, I'm not successful, uh, by any massive like leaps and bounds, but like, I would tell anybody who wants to work in film, like it's so doable. Like there's so many facets to get involved somehow. yeah, Yeah. Yeah. Like you can like being a crew member, you can work in like a million different departments, not a million, but like you can work in like so many, I won't get into all of them. Um, 
but you know, if, if, if anybody listening to this is stuck, you'll have my social media handle on this. Yeah, yeah. I, I urge anybody to just message me and I will, I've got like literally like stock emails that I just like send to people just to help you know? them. Get yeah. Their foot in yeah. The door Cause every, every now and then my parents will be like, Oh, so-and-so's cousin is like getting into film and like, what advice would you have? And like, mm. You don't have to be a filmmaker. You can be a film worker and you can work, you know, as a set PA or an assistant director or a grip or here I am getting into all the things that I wouldn't <laughs> say. But like you can, you can like literally work dozens and dozens of jobs where you just go and, and they'll train you yeah. to learn how to Something make movies on, yeah just get in there and some departments are going to be more fly on the wall more logistical and more like observatory than like getting like 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 set design is much more like getting in getting your hands dirty being being a camera assistant is way more um close to the action than yeah. being like a locations pa you know so it might take a couple years to like learn took me fucking decades to learn this. Like, yeah. cause I kept, that's, that's one thing. If you need to sleep eight or nine hours, which I actually do, I don't advise working <laughs> in film as your bread and butter, as you start your road to producing, writing, directing, whatever it is. Cause you're not, drained. you're not going to like get out of film school and immediately be a producer or a writer or director. Yeah. Um, but, but no, some, I, I understand what you're saying in that the film industry is one of those unique occupations where there are so many different parts to making it happen yeah. that like, what other job can you, where there's, oh, you're good at makeup. Yeah. We got a spot for that. Oh, you're good at like uh, designing sets. Oh yeah. We got that. Yeah. You know, you're good at directing, acting. There's so many moving pieces in yeah. a film or television production that really it is, like you said, there's, if you want to be involved, they'll, you can find something you can do yeah. some, some way to get involved. Exactly. So yeah, I don't have a dream job. Like, like I, I, um, like my brother's son is training to be a paramedic oh, cool. and I just found that out and I was like, wow, like the kudos, noble profession. Kudos, yeah. Like. Kudos to you. And, and, and that, that just kind of got me thinking to, recently because i my dad just told me that a couple of days ago and that kind of like got me thinking like man to be like 18 again to be thinking about mm. that like what am i gonna 17 18 19 just being like you know that first year at college like thinking about like what you're gonna major in what you're what am i trucking towards and and obviously i had a blue collar hands-on skill which was cooking um, which I don't regret because I cook three meals a day. Yeah, yeah exactly. It's, That's it's, a skill you're always still going to use. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But like, yeah, I can't, I was like paramedic. Oh man. Like I wouldn't last a day. <laughs> and like my dad and I were watching Ambulance, the new, um, fucking Michael Bay movie oh, last with night. The, yeah, yeah. yeah. And this, the opening scene, spoiler, is this chick like getting impaled Ugh. and like paramedics showing up on the scene. And I'm just there like watching. I'm like, I'm like, oh, not in a million like, years. He's going to be a paramedic. Like yeah. I just would die. Like my first day on the job, I would be like in a back alley, like puking, <laughs> you know, my partner's double parked. I'm like, Ugh. you know, take me to Timmy's like, you know, so like, yeah, I, I don't, I can't think of another job because I know I couldn't do any other blue collar line yeah. of work. Like maybe I could be a landscaper. No, but I, it sounds like you've had a you clear know. vision from a young age that you haven't really wavered from and continue on to this day. That's a cool answer. Yeah. But it's funny. And I, my temperament isn't very aligned with the temperament of someone who has to um, just survive and thrive in film. And I've kind of alluded to that along this yeah. conversation so that like, 
you can love watching, and this is a good place to end on, like, you can love watching movies. You can grow up love loving movies and loving film theory, writing about film and all that. Artists tend to work alone. And sensitive, emotional people that are also artists usually tend to find artistic outlets and mediums that allow them to work alone. Mm like a fucking pianist a or painter a or painter yeah, or whatever yeah. film by definition is a collaborative medium yeah. and it is a very grueling blue collar thick skin. You walk onto a film set and you will survive and thrive more if you're a roadie or a carny or a tradesman like, mm. you know, more than if you're actually some like actor, creative writer, yeah. like coming on Visionary set to learn. Yeah. yeah. And like, and you come in like from some like poetic, emotional, artistic standpoint, like you might be chewed up and spit out. Like, yeah. so you, so you might just not last a show. Like if you take a show call, which might last like a couple weeks to a couple months, you might not make it through. Like you might, mm. it's, it's intense. You can work like 16, 17 hour days sometimes. Like you got to play friggin'. nice with others. Yeah. So what I've learned is like, find out what department you could survive in, mm. even if you don't thrive, even if you like, even if you semi enjoy it and like the people you work with and you're in a position to learn, then do that because Big, if you're in it for the long haul, then big set experience is important. Mm. And learning to work well with others is important. But if if no one likes waking up on four hours sleep, no. and I don't think it's overly sustainable. So to come full circle to all those young kids that are going the YouTube route, the client-based videography route, the branded content route, you know, you see them making like 15 second ads on Instagram for like some sparkling water company. Like honestly, more power to them because that shit can lead to directing commercials. Mm. And Stepping even, stones, even yeah. where I'm at now, I'm kind of like, fuck, why didn't I, <laughs> why didn't I, get into directing commercials when I was in my twenties. It's interesting because we, everything you're kind of ending on here, I had a question that I never actually got to, but it was like, if you could go back, I guess, cause we were talking about Graham passing away. And, um, when something like that happens in my life, I definitely reflect on like, where am I at and what do I want to accomplish? It, it makes you reevaluate mm -hmm. things when someone passes away. And I was going to ask like, if you could go back in time and talk to a younger version of yourself, what advice would you give? But you kind of just touched on that. Yeah, I would. And it would going back to what I said earlier, it'd be like, stick to your guns. Yeah. Like find what's your brand. And, and it's tricky what you want to say from a kind of like existential perspective, like that comes with age. Yeah. I would, I would actually tell myself, and I'm only re now realizing this like very recently is start extremely small, do spec commercials and music videos, do things that are like under three minutes, like a commercials, 30, yeah. 30 seconds, 60 seconds, music videos, a couple, couple minutes, do something where there's a supply and a demand. Mm. And it's not just you alone with your art. Cause when it's, <laughs> when it's you alone and when you're starting out as an independent filmmaker, you're also going to pen from not only your writer director cap, but also your producer's cap. Mm. You're going to be a bit of, you have to corral everybody together, even short films that takes money and resources and people Coordination. to make, yeah. yeah, you have to fucking band like five or six people together to make a film. That's tricky. So I would say start small, like 30 seconds, do stuff for other people, do something for a local band, a local business, yeah. like get, get the experience some and... exchange of like, and then it's more like commerce. Like here, I made this thing for you. Mm. The, the video is now a product and you start that automatically trains your brain to look 
look at it more from a entrepreneurial sales business type standpoint yeah. versus like you working as some like cog in the wheel, some pawn in the industry, you know, like you feel like such a low man on the totem pole trying to work your way up in this chain. These young kids that are just making videos, they're totally removed from that. They're just making stuff and selling it to yeah. clients. No middleman. No middleman. Yeah. I would, I would honestly say like, do that, build your own little production company, then make your own passion projects on the side. Yeah. And then you're just, then you're constantly making stuff and you're not standing around on someone else's set, helping them build their dream. Yeah, exactly. You yeah. know, like that can be, it's great. I'm not knocking it. Like I said, big set experience, all the contacts, all the people that you meet. But it, it's normal it's, in that situation you know, to get envious and, and uh, insecure possibly if you have your own dream you're trying to get to. And like you said, instead you're part of somebody else's yeah. vision coming yeah. into play. So that can be good and the experience and all that, but that can also make you yearn for like, well, I want to do that. I don't want to be this guy's little component. Yeah. I want to be the driving force, you know? And And if the lifestyle was different, then I would say, fuck it. Go for yeah. it. Stay in that world. But the thing is, is that it's like 70, 80 hour weeks. Then a show wraps. Then you don't know when you're going to be employed again. Yeah, that's sketchy. And then you're just waiting. You, I always tell people, it's like you can't control when the phone rings. Mm. You can turn down work, but you can't control when the phone rings. Yeah. So crew work, working on other people's movies is actually kind of anxiety inducing. It's not like sales where you can go like head hunting and pitching and there's all this like, there's Make all these like, happen, like yeah. lead generation and you're like constantly hunting for clients. Yeah. ADHD minds love sales. They love like hunting. Mm. There's, there's something actually... <laughs> I will answer your, we should wrap this up, but I will answer your, your question. Sales. Sales. Okay. okay. Yeah. Uh, and, and that wasn't even a dream. I read that in a book. I read that in a book recently. And if anybody, anybody with ADHD watching this, if they need a backup career path. Sales. Sales apparently is it. Apparently our brains are like hardwired for sales. Don't ask me more. I don't know much about it. <laughs> there's a certain degree of sales in film, which is nice. For there's, sure. There's yeah. like a little bit of everything in film, but like, honestly, I think, I think if, it, if I, if I knew now what I, what I do now back then, you know, yeah. um, yeah, it would, it would, it would have been that advice for a film, stick to your guns, make your own shit. And then back up his sales. That'd be some real back to the future shit. But yeah, if, <laughs> if, if a 35 year old Matt Joyce went back in time and said, fuck all this, you want a white collar job, you want to live a normal life. You want to put a down payment on a house, yeah. wife, kids, all that shit sales. And I got lots of buddies in film that in, in sales, film and sales, but the sales ones, they're, they got no bags under their eyes. They're well <laughs> driving a nice car. There's a car in the driveway. Yeah, yeah a new baby on the way, you know, and, and Lord knows when that, that nuclear family and that normal life will, will pass well, away, but I'm sure it'll, it'll come your way. You're a great dude and a smart guy, but, uh, you're also, you know, that's where the term, the tortured artist comes from, right? Like it's, yeah, you, you can't shut it off. Yeah. You can try, but you'll just be lying to yourself. <laughs> yeah, well, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Robert Redford talks about like the people, there's some people that quit. Uh, and then there's some people that don't quit and keep on going and sales. I don't know. I'm, I'm, it's, it's still pretty far back on my mind. So I'm, 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 there's, there's no inkling to quit just yet. All right. Well, yeah. at least, you know, you've got a, a fallback career potentially. Yeah. yeah. All with, right. Man. With less schooling than, than, than med school. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah well this was fun man this is great and, man uh, Thank it was you so really much. yeah such an awesome experience and um i'm bummed out that it took you know graham's passing for us to yeah. to reconnect but i'm glad yeah. that part of it happened 
And uh, I'd like to think that he was here with us in the studio. Oh, His energy was here. I know he probably would have loved to watch this. Because, um, yeah. you know, yeah. he's, I don't know. I, I miss the guy already. And then I, I, uh, I, what a sad way to end the episode. But whatever, this is a tribute to Graham, this, this episode. This is for Graham, know? man. Yeah. 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 So thank you, everyone, for watching, and we'll see you next time. Thanks, man.